Ivanka went co-host, I think. She's not yet. I'm a monitor. I'm, uh, do I need to be co-host? I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, discussion monitor. Maybe I should not. I don't need to. I don't know. But it's okay if we have a backup. She wins a co-host. Who else should be co-host? Thank you. And here's the YouTube live link. Okay. For today. That's up. So, so Mac, you're going to give her two minutes, uh, which is at a six, uh, give her um, na, na warning, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'll mention that at the beginning, Danny and I worked out already. We'll do a little introduction. Okay. Welcoming folks and giving a few uh, directions. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody. So, Jiwen and Michael, you know how to unmute people? Uh, okay, I, I can unmute myself now. Um, then if I want to unmute others, Go. You go to you go to their name and it'll say ask to unmute. You can't actually unmute them. You can permit them to be unmuted. They have to turn on their mic manually. Okay. And I'll make Ming Wai a co-host as well. He's just coming in. Uh-huh. Okay, I see. Where did Ming Wai go? There he is. So Michael, then I will just end the session since I was I will um, chair the discussion. Yep. You know, yeah, okay. Even it's very interesting background on your wall behind you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you, <It's, laughs> yes, uh, it's a piece. What is, what is this? <laughs> yeah, thank you. You like it? <laughs> Just something put on the wall. <laughs> Good morning, Good Scott. Morning, Scott. Morning, Graham. How are you? I'm well. I enjoyed your piece on Vox. Uh, I heard oh. it a couple of days ago. Oh, man, that was so much fun. Um, and crazy that everyone's kind of little bits lined up so well. So that was that was good. Well, that was about probably about an eighth of the actual total things we talked about. I even talked about Tracer on there, but you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, no, you did. It was good. <laughs> so is Dale, Dale here yet? Dale Wong? No, I haven't seen her yet. That's a well, it's time. We can, yeah, we can she should be introduced speaker on side show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then who is going? Bob, Bobby, is uh, Bobby here also? Yep, Bobby's here. Okay, good, good. Okay. I'm here.
Theo is not here yet. Okay, that's a problem. Um, who is going to do that? Tan. Um, well, I'm prepared to share the screen if. Um, okay. Yeah. Then I. You you also need to time yeah you time and share screen um then I do oh then I cannot do slash show if you share screen you should do the slash show right Mac I should do what like the slide the, like a forward slide oh, there's there's Dia okay okay good good <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So uh, if somebody can make Dia a co-host. Okay, Dia, can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. I can make her co-host. So who is it again? Sorry, it's... Dio Wang, B I E. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. There you go. Okay, great. And and Dia, you have the slides. Are you ready to share the yeah. screen when we get there? Yeah. Okay. Let me try. Uh... Okay, great. Okay, so maybe we should go ahead and get started. Yeah, but please do control L so it will be full screen. All right, I've started recording it. <laughs> um, uh, can okay. I include my 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 uh, presentation now? Uh, well, uh, we have some introduction, and then you will uh, continue after us. Okay. After. Yes. Okay. So, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and get us started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, on behalf of the ACPC Steering Committee and the Deep Convective Cloud Leadership, including myself, Jiwen Fan, and Scott Collis, um, welcome to those who have been here for the first two days in the low cloud section and to the, the new folks who have, are here. Uh, the next two days, we'll discuss uh, deep convection aerosol interactions. We have four sessions. Um, Today, we're gonna to start with an overview of aerosol deep convective interactions, and then talk about severe storms and weather hazards. And then tomorrow, we're gonna to talk about uh, aerosol convection interactions around the world um, from Asia to South America, and then about the Tracer Field Campaign and the ACPC Roadmap. Um, we have lots of talks to go through, so uh, they're going to be short. Uh, we thank everyone for their uh, attentive, attentiveness to the time. Um, we also encourage you to upload recorded presentations up to 15 minutes long on the ACPC website. Um, so if you have more content you'd like to share, please do that. On the speakers today, uh, for the speakers, we'll, we have eight minute presentations um, that we're gonna start with. I'm going to give you a warning at two minutes. Uh, so to try to start wrapping up, and then we have some very short presentations, two minutes. Uh, those I will just give a warning at the two minute uh, mark. Uh, we encourage the speakers to use the annotate function if um, they uh, would like to do that to highlight some things while they're giving their slide, kind of like a laser pointer if we were in person. Um, for the attendees, if you have questions, please put those in the chat. Um, if we have time for questions at the end of each uh, talk, we'll, uh, we'll read them from there. Um, during discussion time, we'll use the raise hand function. So please uh, locate that and uh, be prepared to use that. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it off to Danny, one of the ACPC co-chairs uh, for some opening remarks. Danny. Yes, uh, I'm very excited about having uh, come thus far with ACPC, see such large community interested in both shallow and deep clouds. And especially when we get closer to the Tracer uh, uh, project in uh, Houston, which is a culmination of, the, of one of the major visions of uh, ACPC. Uh, so I encourage you to uh, uh, actually be cogni 
to, to recognize the, the, this uh, great uh, upcoming opportunity. And uh, when we uh, uh, have some discussion or questions, uh, let's uh, try to see how to frame it uh, in uh, the tracer uh, experiment in a way that uh, we'll be able actually to do something about it and not just uh, uh, discuss it academically. So with that, I suggest that we'll start the presentation of Alexander Chaim. Okay, great. So um, thank you, Danny. Um, we're going to do things a little bit differently today. Uh, we've asked an early career scientist to serve as the uh, person introducing uh, the speakers in each session. So um, in this first session, Dia Wang from Brookhaven National Lab is going to be introducing the speakers. Uh, so Dia, please uh, introduce our first speaker. So the first speaker is Alexander Kain, and the title is What is Convective in, uh, Invigoration? So go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, uh, everybody. Uh, uh, just to understand how to, to move uh, this. You just uh, asked to I use my uh, uh, screen share to show my presentation. Now. No, no. You just asked. You just ask for a uh, next slide, and then. Oh, it will... next slide. Nice slide. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so effects uh, of uh, aerosol on clouds and precipitation attracted attention, attention of investigators for uh, several decades. And, uh, nevertheless, many problems still remain uh, and many issues are being debated. Uh, so one of the uh, such questions is uh, so-called convection invigoration. Uh, some researcher reported to such uh, invigoration and some other researchers denied. Uh, to a large extent, uh, this uh, situation, in my opinion, is related to the fact, fact that uh, the concept of convection invigoration is not well defined. Uh, and, uh, I suppose that uh, the, the first uh, concept of a uh, uh, Arazol induced convective invigoration was introduced by uh, Danny Rosenfeld in 2008. And you know, you see very uh, um, well this uh, well, very known uh, picture uh, above this uh, development of uh, clean uh, uh, cloud, deep, uh, deep uh, convective clouds in clean atmosphere, the deep convective clouds in polluted atmosphere. So in polluted atmosphere, droplets are uh, smaller, they do not collide, uh, so they ascend uh, and uh, above freezing levels, then they freeze, uh, producing additional uh, latent heat release of fusion. And uh, this uh, uh, effect of mainly he focused, Danny focused uh, on this point largely, uh, leads to um, uh, invigoration, to intensification of both vertical velocity. Uh, uh, we get uh, higher um, uh, uh, top height uh, and uh, larger precipitation. So these uh, three factors are often defined as a convection uh, invigoration. Can uh, the next slide, please? Uh, okay, uh, at the same time, uh, these three factors uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, are not, uh, can take place uh, not at the same time, it not uh, so, so uh, increase in uh, vertical velocity can uh, uh, be accompanied by a decrease in precipitation, et, et cetera. Uh, and in, the, uh, in uh, addition, uh, mechanism of, uh, say, intensification of, uh, of clouds by aerosols take place also, mechanism take place also in warm clouds. And uh, below, I would like to, to present uh, an example 
uh, of aerosol effects on warm uh, clouds, and we simulated uh, this cloud with uh, 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 less simulation uh, with spectral beam microphysics and resolution of 10 meters. But first, I would like to show mechanism, uh, main mechanism uh, why uh, aerosols uh, can affect, uh, uh, say, vertical velocity or uh, liquid water content, uh, uh, even in uh, warm clouds without uh, formation of ice. Uh, let us consider uh, this equation for supersaturation, very known equation, supersaturation in a, the ascending adiabatic parcel. So it can be, uh, say, in the cloud core. Uh, this is S is supersaturation, uh, W vertical velocity, A and B, uh, A1, 2 uh, coefficients, slightly dependent on temperature, and QL is liquid water content. Uh, so in, in case of vertical uh, motion, this equation can be written in this uh, simple way, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, these coefficients are not strongly depend on or weakly depend on temperature, this uh, uh, can be integrated, and we get the following simple uh, expression that uh, liquid water content or mixing ratio uh, depends uh, on height. Uh, on height and minus this storm with supersaturation. Uh, now uh, we remember that uh, in uh, polluted clouds, uh, supersaturation is less, lower than in clean clouds. So this term is uh, smaller. So in polluted clouds, liquid water uh, content uh, is larger than in uh, clean uh, clean clouds in, uh, in, in core, in cloud upgrades. Uh, actually, larger uh, liquid water content means that, uh, mm, uh, that uh, latent heat release is larger. So vertical velocity is also should be larger. Please, next slide. Two, two minutes left, Alexander. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, here you can see this uh, cloud that is formed. Here, the, this uh, what we simulated. Now uh, we have uh, uh, the, the development of the, the, the dependence of vertical velocity, liquid water content, and uh, buoyancy on uh, adiabatic fraction. Adiabatic fraction is large in uh, in cloud core, and we see. In polluted clouds, we have very larger vertical velocity, larger uh, cloud, uh, liquid water content, uh, larger uh, concentration, larger buoyancy. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, uh, now you can see time dependencies of uh, mean norms uh, before. Before, oh yeah. Uh, time dependencies of uh, liquid uh, water mixing ratio, vertical velocity, and buoyancy. And uh, in clouds with uh, aerosol concentration 500, 50, and 5. And you see uh, that uh, the, in all cases, uh, blues of uh, polluted clouds has uh, larger liquid water content, vertical velocity, and buoyancy. So we see that uh, this is a convex configuration. But please, next slide. Uh, but here, uh, if we see, if we look at the precipitation, uh, we see that uh, there is no precipitation at all in polluted clouds and significant precipitation in, in, uh, um, in uh, uh, clean clouds. So uh, increase in vertical velocity is not accompanied by increase in precipitation, but in opposite, uh, increase in vertical velocity is accompanied to decrease in precipitation in warm uh, clouds. Please, next. Uh, yes, please pay attention that if uh, 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 some models use uh, saturation adjustment uh, 
uh, approach uh, s equal to zero and we have no uh, uh, difference between uh, no if aerosol effect so uh, the saturation adjustment uh, just uh, makes uh, diffusion growth uh, non-sensitive to aerosols non next please Yes, uh, in another interesting mechanism uh, of uh, invigoration, uh, even uh, both in uh, uh, shallow and in deep clouds is uh, in cloud nucleation. You can see uh, these areas of uh, uh, nucleation of new uh, aerosols. Uh, and uh, these uh, areas, in uh, this is the core, cloud core. Uh, number of modes in uh, in uh, uh, droplet side distribution, uh, and we, we see that uh, uh, here we have uh, in polluted case uh, we we have significant in cloud nucleation. Uh, so new droplets and new latent heat release. Please next slide. Alexander, your, your time is up. If you can wrap things up, please. Sorry? Uh, the, the time is up. If you could wrap things up, that would be great. So, so the, the, the same effect we see uh, in uh, deep convective clouds, uh, we, we have uh, increase in uh, concentration, increase in uh, let, uh, vertical velocity, and increase in precipitation. Next, please. It's very interesting that uh, saturation adjustment as uh, equal to zero uh, doesn't allow us uh, to, to get large super saturation in clouds. Uh, so so uh, saturation adjustment kills also this effect as well. Next, please. Uh, as regards to the effects of uh, Aerosols on precipitation, it is a more complicated story, uh, and it is necessary to, uh, to take into account that in polluted clouds, we have a larger uh, generation of condensate by uh, both larger evaporation of condensate. And uh, depending on uh, relative humidity of environment here, and wind shear and other factors, uh, we can get uh, both increase in, uh, and decrease in precipitation. So it's necessary to study this problem uh, separately. So uh, we need to define uh, actually uh, uh, convective integration as increase in vertical uh, velocity. Please next slide is my conclusion. Uh, so we see that uh, aerosol affects uh, uh, both vertical velocity, precipitation, and cloud uh, uh, top height, but uh, they are not uh, at, uh, take place not at the same time, and the vertical increase in vertical velocity can uh, be accompanied by uh, decrease in precipitation or. Uh, uh, without effect on drop height, e on cloud height, if uh, clouds are limited uh, by uh, inversion layer. It's actually it's my uh, the, what I wanted to uh, to say, and uh, that uh, effect of on precipitation uh, requires uh, the utilization of reliable uh, microphysical. Uh, models and such uh, assumptions like uh, saturation adjustment can substantially distort uh, and even may fully eliminate aerosol effect. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexander. I think we're going to have to move along. If folks have questions for Alexander, I encourage you to uh, put that in the chat. Okay. So, so Dia, can you go ahead and introduce the next speaker then? So the next speaker is uh, Danny Rosenfeld. The title is Observational Quantification of Aerosol Invigoration 
for deep convective cloud life cycle properties based on a uh, geostationary satellite. So then you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this uh, is a just recently published paper by uh, uh, Zenshin Pan, who is uh, co-advised by myself and for you, Mao from uh, Wuhan University and for, by uh, Yan Yan Zhu from Nanjing University. So now, uh, next slide, please. We'll see how actually, uh, observationally, the uh, uh, invigoration uh, occurs. Uh, okay, so we used a geostationary satellite to track the uh, life cycle of evolution of uh, the convection within uh, fixed windows of uh, 10 degrees uh, longitude by five degrees latitude. Uh, uh, this uh, orientation is to accommodate the di uh, preferred direction of the uh, convection. And uh, we didn't uh, track individual cells, but rather the evolution and decay of the whole convection within uh, these domains. And uh, this way, uh, uh, we uh, allow uh, an enlargement of the, enlarging the definition of the invigoration to not only individual cell, but the whole convective cluster. Uh, and uh, we use the Metrosat uh, geostationary satellite data, mirror to aerosols, and NSEP reanalysis data. And here uh, we can see on, on the right panel, uh, the uh, time evolution uh, of the, uh, here is the, convective precipitation, uh, uh, rain intensity. And on the bottom panel, we see the, uh, the, the actually the anvil area and the convective uh, precipitation area is much smaller. Whereas the, uh, so uh, when we integrate the whole thing, we can uh, integrate the rainfall, the lifetime and the, uh, echo top height uh, or, or cloud top temperature rather of the convective cores. Next, please. Next slide. So here is, we have in, in total uh, almost 60,000 uh, uh, such uh, regimes, uh, such uh, areas over tropical uh, land uh, between 20 north and 20 south. So uh, you can see here the, uh, on the left panel, the cloud top temperature in Kelvin as a function of the fine aerosol uh, uh, mass uh, concentration in microgram per cubic meter. So you can see that the uh, cloud top temperature uh, decreases by about uh, 10 degrees uh, when uh, uh, you go from the clean to the polluted uh, situation. Uh, the, this is a density plot with the frequency of cases. These are the, the colors. The, uh, uh, the life lifetime increases by a factor of uh, 1.5, uh, and the rainfall increases by almost a factor of three, but you see that uh, it increases up to an optimum concentration of about five micrograms per uh, cubic uh, meters, and beyond that, uh, uh, the reverse occurs probably because uh, of the radiative effects of the aerosols and uh, because of the effect that when you have so much uh, rainfall, uh, the, the rainfall scavenge much of the aerosols. Next slide, please. Uh, so the, the big question is uh, how much is uh, just uh, mere co-variability of the aerosols with meteorology and how much is really uh, the, can be attributed to the aerosols. So we looked at uh, uh, all the uh, meteorological properties that uh, could be relevant, like precipitable water on the left column, cape uh, on the column to the next column, uh, 450 hectopascal omega, uh, the vertical wind shear, and 850 uh, hectopascal temperature. And you can see that for each case, let's uh, go to the precipitable water. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, for example, take this uh, 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 case for the uh, lifetime. Uh, you can see that the clouds uh, uh, live longer when there is more precipitable water, but the, the, the basic shape of the cloud lifetime or, if you, or uh, the cloud uh, rainfall amount or the cloud uh, top temperature remains the same independent 
independently for uh, all the, different, the various uh, uh, methodological stratifications, uh, they seem to uh, work in the, uh, to behave independent of each other. And the effect remains uh, as strong or even stronger when we constrain it. Uh, next slide, next slide, please. Uh, so then we try to constrain two factors at a time, like the precipitable water, uh, on the left, uh, the lowest precipitable water, and to the right, uh, the highest precipitable water, uh, divided to three thirds. And uh, the cape uh, is modulating the lines. Cape, uh, uh, this is the lowest cape, medium cape, and largest cape. And you can see how cloud top temperature uh, in, indeed, as expected, becomes colder with uh, uh, more cape, but uh, uh, also uh, colder with more aerosols for the same cape. Uh, so, uh, so uh, and, and we did so also for the other properties, and basically the effect rem remains the same uh, quantitatively, like the big scatter that you saw uh, in the second slide, uh, without any uh, apparent uh, uh, indicated effect of the uh, of the uh, meteorology. Uh, so and and. Uh, uh, when you do this uh, meteorological constraint, or double constraint, you get a cloud top uh, temperature decrease of when you go from uh, the cleanest to the optimum uh, of uh, about uh, uh, five micrograms per cu uh, cubic meter of fine aerosols uh, of more than 10 degrees. Uh, lifetime increases by a factor of uh, 1.3 and rainfall increases by a factor of 2.6, uh, which is huge. Uh, so uh, two, two minutes danny okay so i'll wrap up and uh, just uh, discuss some of the questions uh, uh, th this this uh, factor looks huge and i don't believe that it is all uh, actual additional rainfall uh, i think that uh, there is uh, some uh, uh, feedbacks uh, like uh, uh, additional uh, convergence that cause real additional rainfall but some might uh, be caused by uh, measurement bias that are related to the aerosols and the, and the way that we measure the, the rainfall. Uh, and I uh, hope to present some results uh, in the next uh, um, ACPC meeting. Um, in addition, uh, the, uh, the fact that the, uh, the invigoration, indicated invigoration uh, appears independent of the aerosols, it doesn't mean that there is lack of co-variability between the aerosols and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the meteorology. Uh, I think that there is. Uh, we are working on that now. Uh, and uh, this is one uh, of the bigger challenges to see what, uh, how this co-variability behaves and what is the causality direction of this co-variability. And I think uh, as, as we had in the, for, for the shallow clouds, there is similar uh, two-way causality also for the uh, uh, aerosol and meteorology that drive the deep convective clouds. So, I'll, so it, it opens more questions than answers, and that's good. That's the way science should be. And I'll stop here. Okay, uh, I see a question in the chat from Ralph Kahn. Uh, does aerosol type have an impact on the result? Yes, uh, here we look just uh, on the uh, on, on the uh, fine aerosols, but uh, 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 apparently, especially over ocean, when we look at uh, uh, the, the uh, ultra fine aerosols uh, from one hand uh, 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 and the uh, sea salt particles, uh, on the other hand, uh, have impact. Uh, and then if we stratify it uh, by, uh, or, or constrain the fine aerosols by the uh, uh, sea salt, we get uh, to see very interesting uh, results that I hope also to show in the next uh, ACPC meeting. Okay, and I see um, a question from Andrew Williams. If the causality between aerosols and clouds is not clear, is it fair to say this is evidence for invigoration? If the causality between aerosols and clouds, uh, uh, we, are, we are working on, on, uh, on, the, on establishing the causality. Of course, the, the ultimate way to establish it is with uh, cloud models. 
and uh, comparing uh, the fingerprints uh, of the shape of the relationships with the uh, cloud models uh, show some directions of causality that uh, will uh, that uh, also we are working on that hopefully it will be a very productive year the next one Okay, great. And I see more questions rolling in from Philip and Edward. Uh, Danny, maybe you can answer those in the chat. Okay. Um, I think we need to move on. Uh, so Dia, can you introduce <coughs> you here? So the, the next speaker is Guy uh, Dagan. So the title is Idealized Cloud Resolving Simulation Overestimate the uh, Effect of Aerosol on the Environment. So take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so the work I'll present today study the effect of aerosol on the environmental thermodynamic conditions in cloud resolving model simulations. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, a technical word about limited area cloud resolving simulations. Uh, when we simulate a limited area in the atmosphere, we must consider the large scale effect on our domain or the large scale forcing or the boundary conditions of our domain. Uh, which could be done in many ways that could be categorized in two different groups. Uh, we can either do it in a more idealized setup where the boundary conditions are usually kept constant in time or, uh, or, or change in time in a predefined gradual way or even completely neglected like in RCE simulations. Uh, but on the other hand, it could be done in more realistic setup where the boundary conditions are usually taken from something like the analysis and um, then we try to represent a specific case in the atmosphere and the boundary condition change more realistically with time. And I'll show you now that this somewhat technical issue could determine to a large extent the aerosol effect on uh, clouds in cloud resolving simulations. And next slide, please. Uh, the motivation of this study came from a recent paper that was published in Science a few months ago by Abut and Cronin, uh, where they used idealized simulation to, to investigate aerosol effect on deep convection. Um, they used a weak temperature gradient setup where the temperature profile is nudged back to a, a baseline profile and a large scale circulation is allowed to form in the domain. And they simulated a few different levels of cloud droplet number concentrations. And they showed that with increasing the aerosol pollution, they get more entrainment from the clouds. And so they get a quite significant increase in the humidity of the atmosphere uh, under more polluted conditions which then invigorate cloud development. So they proposed a mechanism that they called humidity entrainment mechanism to explain cloud invigoration by this increase in humidity. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, this was done in idealized setup and they got quite large increase in humidity and we wanted to compare uh, their simulations with uh, other realistic uh, simulations to, 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 to see how it looked like in more realistic setups. And next slide, please. Yeah, so over here you can see the, the change in humidity, uh, polluted minus clean, and the relative change in humidity in panel B uh, for the idealized simulations of Abut and Cornin, and 30 different realistic simulations that we could get um, that were conducted with eight different models and microphysical schemes. Uh, those simulations include the seven models that participated in the ACPC case study over Houston. Uh, but they also include different simulations under different environmental conditions, both over ocean and land, with different domain sizes, different grid resolution, different simulations duration, and so on. And you can see that all the realistic simulations so, show, uh, show a much, much weaker humidity increase compared to the idealized setup of Abut and Cornin, um, something like an order of magnitude difference. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and please also note that the humidity increase in Abut and Cornin is positive throughout the entire troposphere and gets almost to a doubling of the humidity at some of the levels. And this raises questions about the source of this humidity. In reality, we would expect that the humidity change would be limited by the availability of water vapor that is available to converge into the domain, while in the weak temperature gradient uh, setup, we do not have such limitation. And so we can get very high, probably unrealistic changes in humidity. Uh, we also calculated the radiative effect of this increase in humidity to be 13.5 watts per meter square. So something like 3.5 times the effect of doubling of the CO2. So really a, a, a strong increase in humidity, probably unrealistic that overestimate the effect of the humidity and climate mechanism in, in, in response of deep convective clouds to aerosol. Uh, next slide, please. 
So yeah, this was for deep convection, but the same argument could be presented for shallow convection. Uh, it was proposed before that uh, initial rain suppression by aerosol would lead to more evaporation at the top of the cloudy layer, and hence deepening of the cloudy layer. And this deepening of the cloudy layer can eventually cause a, a buffering of the aerosol effect and precipitation because deeper clouds tend to precipitate more. And this effect can be easily seen in, in idealized LES simulations of shallow convection, where we get this increase in humidity and deepening of the cloudy layer. And it was even uh, shown by Seifert et al. that you can get two different regimes. If you simulate very long idealized LES simulations with fixed boundary conditions and no diurnal cycle, you first get a transient response uh, uh, in which aerosols still have effect on precipitation. And later on, the system can get to an equilibrium conditions where aerosol do not have uh, effect on precipitation. And this, I think, raises question whether which uh, stage is more representative of nature. Are most shallow cloud fields in nature are in a transient state or in a, an equilibrium state? Uh, next slide, please. And previously, we used observations to show that most of the shallow cloud fields in nature are in a transient state. The boundary conditions basically just change fast enough to prevent the cloud field from getting to these equilibrium conditions. So the transient stage uh, should probably be the one that is more representative of nature. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, and similarly to the deep convective case, uh, cases, uh, here we compare the change in humidity and the relative change in humidity for uh, two idealized simulations and many 40 something uh, realistic simulations. It again was conducted under a wide range of uh, environmental conditions and so on. Uh, we see here two different idealized simulations, the blue and the red curves here that represent different cloud depths. Uh, the blue one is shallower cloud depths and the red one is deeper one. And both of them show an increase in humidity at the upper part of the cloudy layer, but just different cloud depth uh, and tendency of drying near the surface, um, which is also seen to some degree in the realistic uh, simulations. We do see a tendency of uh, drying near the surface and moistening at the upper part. But in the realistic simulations, it's something like an order of magnitude weaker response compared to the realistic simulations. And um, I want to specifically point out here on spilatile simulations that were conducted, the, the red and green curves, uh, that were conducted with the same model, the UM, uh, simulating the same baseline conditions, the same, the same case with the same grid resolution, simulation duration, and so on but one time with realistic boundary conditions and one time with idealized uh, uh, boundary conditions. And again, we see that this direct comparison of uh, realistic and idealized simulations suggests that the idealized simulations overestimate by something like an order of magnitude, the response of the humidity to aerosol perturbation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one minute left. Yeah, that's the conclusion. Uh, yeah. so. Basically, all those results suggest that idealized simulation tend to overestimate the effect of aerosols on the thermodynamic conditions, basically because the boundary conditions do not change with time and we do not have a diurnal cycle. And that's inflate the role of the clouds in the domain in setting the thermodynamic conditions, which could have large implications about the total aerosol effect on clouds in both deep and shallow clouds. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. I want to say that uh, uh, we, we found that we, uh, in our uh, observation analysis, uh, we checked the hypothesis of uh, Abbott and Cronin, and, and we have indications that uh, uh, agreeing with you, uh, Guy, that uh, they uh, largely overestimate the, this uh, term of uh, feedback. Nice. Any other, uh, I see Graham has a question. Uh, uh, very nice guy. Um, thanks, I, I just, I think the difficulty when one talks about realistic simulations is um, sort of characterizing what you mean by that because now we're faced with a whole host of uh, atmospheric conditions with different temp, uh, time scales and figuring out how those all play together um, and, and you know, sorting this all out becomes quite a bit more difficult. Uh, so 
ha have you thought about how to address the different timescales when you get into the realistic simulations? Yeah, so no doubt, I mean, the, the realistic simulations do not represent uh, changes in the large scale circulation that could be formed by aerosol uh, uh, perturbation that might be important. And uh, that could, I guess, would, could be uh, achieved only when we simulate either large enough domain or even global domain. Um, and uh, I guess that would be the goal. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're right that things like uh, setting different time scale of boundary conditions and different uh, domain sizes and so on, one could expect to see its effect on the, the realistic simulations. But somehow, even when we included many different uh, uh, setups and many different uh, uh, simulation duration and domain sizes and so on, we still got in all of them something which were pretty much consistent between them and completely different from the idealized simulation. Yeah, topic for a longer conversation. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, thank you. With that, I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, Guy, I see there's a question from G. Wen in the chat, if you could uh, go there and answer that. And uh, Dia, can you introduce the next speaker? So the next speaker is Daniel uh, Fernandez. The title is Thermos versus Cloudy Updrafts. And what do they tell us about the uh, microphysics dynamics coupling in deep connection? So Daniel, take it away. Okay, uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, so this is work I've been doing together with Toshi Matsui and Ann Fridlin from NASA. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? So the, some key points to, to get this started. Um, we're interested in looking at links between the updraft dynamics and particularly warm microphysics. We still don't want to go into ice microphysics. Um, and we hope that this might give us some insights for climate model parametrizations. Um, so the way we are doing this is looking at simulations where we can resolve convection, of course, deep convection, uh, of a case study in which we vary aerosol concentrations from uh, relatively clean conditions, continental conditions, to polluted conditions. And we know that we will get some microphysical responses from this, uh, but the big question there is, can, can we see any systematic dynamical responses? And um, so when, when we look at simulations of deep convection where we can resolve it, we need to sample the clouds in some way. We, should, we usually do this through what we call cloudy updrafts, which is just you know, taking some thresholds of liquid water content and vertical velocity, and then defining based on this, which are the grid points that make part of the, of the cloud and which are not. Uh, but we can also do this via thermals, and that is, you know, we know that these these uh, cumulus clouds are made up of thermals, these building blocks of, of, of the clouds. Uh, we can identify these thermals, if you want, you can imagine them as, as bubbles within the cloud, um, and then analyze it in terms of those thermals instead of the cloudy object. So we want to see what's the difference between these two uh, frameworks and what can we learn from this. So can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, this is our case study, which most of you probably already know. Uh, we use NUWARF uh, at the 250 meter resolution. We have their isolated convection. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the details, but the, the, the main thing here is that we have eight simulations, which range from relatively clean conditions, 500 aerosols per cubic centimeter to polluted conditions of 4,000 aerosols per cubic centimeter. And then we choose a three hour period where convection is most active. And there we track thermals and we do the cloudy updraft analysis as well and compare that. The, this thermal tracking is done following some previous work I've done with Steve Sherwood a few years ago. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So this is just to show the, the microphysical responses which we, we expect. And uh, so the top plots show the, the, from the cloudy updraft perspective, what we see in terms of here, for example, is uh, cloud number concentration. Then we have rain number concentration, uh, cloud water mass mixing ratio, rain water mixing ratio, nucleation rate. And we essentially get the, the, the responses we expect. So as we increase aerosol concentration, uh, that, that is these, these values up here. So the, the blue line is the cleaner 
environment, the red one is the, the polluted environment. So we get more um, in, in this direction, we get more cloud number, cloud droplets as we increase the aerosol number concentrations. And the opposite happens, for example, here with rain number concentrations and, and so forth. So that, that's just the, the, the expected microphysical responses. And it doesn't really matter if we look at it from the cloudy off-draft perspective or from the thermals perspective. It's a bit more noisy here in the thermals because there's fewer thermals and cloudy updraft grid points, but essentially we get the same responses. Can we go to the next slide, please? So now if, if we look at the dynamical uh, properties or thermodynamical properties, I have to clear this here. Um, so we, we can look at it again in terms of the cloudy updrafts on the left and in terms of the thermals to the right. Um, we're looking at, for example, latent heating rates here, uh, then vertical velocity and mass flux in both cases. And the, the bottom panels show the differences between uh, each consecutive pair of experiments. So when we have uh, a doubling of, of aerosol concentrations uh, and, and the, this, the, the thick black line that you see in the, in the bottom panels, that is the average of those changes in, in between experiments. So if we would see a strong dynamical uh, response in these experiments, uh, we would expect to have this black line kind of uh, away from the zero line. And, and we, we could argue that, for example, in terms of latent heating rates here in this region, we, we see a slight uh, positive response. So there's a bit more latent heating rate uh, over there. However, if we look individual pairs of experiments, there's, there's quite a bit of, of noise in there and variability. If we look at it in terms of the thermals, we see a similar response on average, but even more noise in between different experiments. So the, the responses are, are may suggest some increase in latent heating rates with uh, increasing aerosol concentrations. But if we would only look at two experiments, one clean, one polluted, we could reach very different conclusions depending on which experiments we look at. And now consistently, we see a, a similar response in terms of vertical velocity. And we would see that, for example, here, a slight increase. It's, it's still small and, and the same here. In, in percentage that's less than 10% of the vertical velocity uh, and, and something similar in terms of mass flux. But overall, the, the big picture here is that we see weak uh, responses. If we can either identify any, they are really within the noise still. So there's a lot of variability and, and we can see that because we have a series of, of various experiments. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Now we can also look at composites of these uh, thermals um, to, to look at their internal structure and, and how the different microphysical properties uh, distribute within the thermals and out of the thermals. And um, so, so in this case, for example, we're looking at supersaturation and notice that these supersaturation values are reached always within the thermals always inside. So the thermals really are acting as sort of natural cloud chambers. That's, that's how we, we really can, can, can see this. And, and the response to aerosol concentrations, you, you can clearly see how uh, as the aerosol concentrations increase in this direction, supersaturation values decrease, uh, cloud number concentrations, they increase, but they're always contained within the thermal. So that's the, it's really that thermals are the, the volumes of air where the, these microphysical processes are most active. So they're really like these natural cloud chambers. And, and again, here we can see that latent heating rates, the, the, the response to the increasing aerosol concentrations is, is very, very small, if anything. We, we really can't see it in this picture. And let's go to the next uh, slide, please. Daniel, about one more minute. Okay. Um, so now th this is the last plot I want to show you. Um, it's a scatter plot where, where we have the, the same quantities I've been showing to you, uh, but now with thermals on the vertical axis and then cloudy objects on the horizontal axis. And the, the, these big, big crosses with colors correspond to averaging the, each entire uh, experiment or simulation. And then the other yellowish greenish uh, colors correspond to, to these points where we take into account the vertical layers. Uh, so, so looking just at the, at the big crosses here, 
and notice that we, we see on the on the first uh, hand we have um, the, a clear microphysical response that I've already shown to you. So we see, for example, here how the, the cloud number concentration increases with increasing aerosol concentration. The same now, the, well, the opposite for rain number concentration down here and nucleation rates as well. But on the other hand, we see, for example, here very clearly how nucleation rates uh, sorry, while uh, latent heating rates and vertical velocity, all these cases are next to each other. So it means that there is no clear, no, no strong dynamical response or thermodynamical response. Um, on the other hand, notice that many of these properties lie on the above the one-to-one -one line, which means that they have like um, higher values for thermals than for when we average over cloudy updraft grid points. And that again points out towards the, the fact that these thermals are really like natural cloud chambers and, and probably very useful to really sample the cloud in a, in a more realistic way than just these cloudy updraft points. Um, and, and maybe just one last thing, uh, notice the vertical velocity up here that corresponds to the upper levels, uh, the top of the clouds probably, uh, where the average vertical velocity when we sample it via thermals is much higher than when we sample it via the, the cloudy updraft points. So, so that also gives us an idea that, that these, these thermals are probably capturing the more important parts of, of the convective activity. Uh, and that, of course, is important for the microphysics as well. So can I go to the next slide, please? That's just a summary. So um, in, in summary, we have no clear systematic dynamical responses. So we, we see some things there, but it's really within the noise yet still. Um, if we would just have single pairs of simulations, we could be reaching conclusions which may not be uh, robust enough, I think. On the other hand, we, we, we can see that thermals act as natural cloud chambers, and that may be really important. And the vertical profiles, especially in the upper levels, have larger relative contributions from thermals than from cloudy objects, which points again towards this, the, 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 probably the, the importance of, of sampling via thermals instead of cloudy objects. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Daniel. In the uh, interest of time, I think we're going to have to move along. But I see one question from Sue in the in the chat. If you could address that there, and if folks have other questions, please um, ask in the chat. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move along to uh, the shorter presentations. Um, so for these presentations, I probably won't interrupt unless you get to the end of your um, four minute uh, presentation plus uh, question time period. And uh, uh, Dia, I think there's a, I think Philip had a separate file. Great, excellent, thank you very much. Two minutes is short, so we plow along. Uh, first of all, acknowledging uh, co-authors Guy, Duncan, and Ross. Next slide, please. So we talk a lot about what affects aerosol uh, or what, what controls aerosol effects on clouds really here and mostly in ACPC. But uh, the question here we're asking is what controls aerosol effects on precipitation on regional scales, on slightly larger scales. And first order, it's pretty clear that you have budgetary control. So first order, you have to balance any release in uh, latent heat. You have to balance by a diabetic heating a change. And that's either through top of the atmosphere fluxes or through uh, surface fluxes. Next slide, please. And that holds in the global mean. If you're on the local scale, obviously you can also diverge dry static energy away from your domain and that, that can locally hold. So then the question is, or, or the problem reduces to the fact that if you're in a certain region, how much energy can you diverge away uh, to account for any change in precipitation or which is here the blue terms, the latent heating associated with it or the diabetic heating, which is associated with aerosol absorption, which can then be balanced by precipitation. Next slide, please. 
So we looked at this quite extensively and referred to guys' papers uh, below, um, where we put just an idealized absorbing plume into an aqua planet in the tropics and extra tropics. And what you see in the tropics, we see this really strong precipitation response, late in heating, increased in rainfall in the tropics, and you can divert to dry static energy away. However, when you put the same plume in the extra tropics, you can't divert the dry static energy efficiently away because you have geostrophic confinement and therefore you can't change precip precipitation change uh, much and you get a very small effect. Next slide, please. So we now ex also extended this concept now to uh, not the effect of absorption, but uh, microphysical perturbations. We do droplet number perturbations in the tropics and extra tropics, and I'll focus on the extra tropics here. And you just put a very strong droplet number of perturbation in aqua planet simulation. Yep, next slide, yep. And what you see is you get, when you get do this droplet number perturbation, you get a very strong liquid water path response here, as is sort of expected. You get a strong increase, a 100% increase roughly in the, in the area of the plume, and you get no effect on precipitation. And again, we, we relate this to the fact that, that uh, you really have budgetary control on precipitation. I'll come back to the tropics in a minute. Um, next slide, please. So to summarize, so these budgetary constraints provide us sort of a new perspective on the fast aerosol effects on precipitation. We see this really strong contrasting response in the tropics and extra tropics. In the extra tropics, you really are limited by the ability to, verge, uh, to diverge energy or converge moisture. And in the microphysical perturbations, we see, again, we see this microphysical change initially, but it doesn't feed through to the precipitation. Next slide, please. So there's one real catch is that in GCMs, we can't really consistently assess effects on stratiform and convective precipitation because they're handled with quite differently. And just to point out, there's a huge potential for global cloud resolving runs to do similar things like that. And that's something we think we should push forward. I'm done. Okay, we have time for a quick question for Philip. So what about the tropics? Well, we can't do it consistently. We, we've done it slightly inconsistently, but it would be more than a half in a minute, Ed. We'll follow, I tell you, <laughs> definitely. So maybe, yeah, so maybe you could discuss that further or, um, or maybe even upload a uh, longer talk. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Philip. Um, Dia, go ahead. So the next speaker is Yu Wei Zhang. Uh, the title of the talk is how representation of con uh, condensation in models impact aerosol effects on deep convective clouds. So you may take it away. Uh, hello, everyone. So then our objective is to um, compare the different aerosol impacts on the deep convective uh, um, convections uh, represented by the spectral beam and the bulk microphysics beams and then investigate the major processes or factors uh, responsible for these um, uh, differences. So we simulated the case which is selected for the ACPC in the comparison study um, occurred on June 19 in 2013. And we run uh, the wolf cam at um, 500 meter resolution. So we did three sensitivity tests by using the spectral beam scheme. Uh, original Morrison scheme and also the modified Morrison scheme, which is um, uh, with uh, uh, explicit uh, subsaturation for condensation and evaporation by replacing the saturation adjustment approach. So as shown here, the spectral beam scheme results show is shown as red and the blue is for the original Morrison and for the yellow, it shows some modified Morrison. So from results, we can see that the, uh, with the spectral beam scheme, we can see a significant uh, evaporation of the deep convective uh, uh, convections. And uh, however, uh, this evaporation uh, is much smaller uh, in the original Morrison. So uh, with the modified Morrison, uh, we can see the similar immigration um, like the spectral beam. So from the time evolution of the latent heat and updraft and the hydrometer property, we can see that uh, this is because firstly, 
the situation adjustment approach uh, removes the dependence of compensation on job leads and aerosols. So this would uh, limit the enhancement of um, uh, condensation, latent heat uh, by aerosols. Secondly, as we can see during the <clears throat> warm rain stage, with the saturation adjustment approach, the warm rain is um, stronger, uh, which leaving a um, much less job lead to living, uh, lifting to the high levels and thus um, uh, leading to a weaker uh, ice processes than the uh, explicit supersaturation approach. So this would uh, further limit the enhancement of ice related processes by the aerosols. So, um, and I think this is, um, uh, we, we can, you can find more details in these uh, papers. Mm, thank you. Okay, we have a time for a question from you, Wei, for you, Wei. Okay, thank you. If you do have a question, uh, please add it to the chat. So the next speaker, sorry. Go ahead. The next speaker is Avichai Efrim. So the title is New Insights on Satellite-Based Detection of, material, of Microphysical Zone of um, Particle Nucleation and Growth in Convective Clouds. So Avichai, uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this research is about the detection of microphysical zones, and especially secondary activation zone uh, in deep convective clouds. And I'd like to acknowledge Ramon Braga, Oliver Lauer, and Mira Polker uh, from the uh, Max Planck Institute in uh, Mainz. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, so uh, Rosenfeld and Lansky in 98 provided a conceptual model for the vertical evolution of uh, the TRE. They hypothesized that uh, the elimination of the largest cloud drops by precipitation leads to a stabilization in, in uh, effective radius with height while allowing only CC and activation at cloud base. However, cloud secondary nucleation can occur higher in the clouds and it has a remarkable impact on the invigoration uh, of the cloud. And this Um, microphysical is the secondary and uh, the TRE uh, profile. And if I can hear you. Uh, can you go to the next? Uh, okay. Well, if uh, Abichai uh, cannot come online, uh, I will try to make up for him. Abichai, can you uh, do you hear me? Can you talk? No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll stand up for, for Abichai. Uh, this is my advisee. He's now in his PhD. Uh, okay. Uh, please, please go back one slide. Anybody hear me? Yes, Danny, I can yes, hear yes. you. Do you hear Abichai also? I cannot hear uh, Abichi and, and can, can you, can you hear forward no. side? Like then I ask could you not go hear back. you. Okay. Uh, what happened? So, so please, uh, please uh, continue from the next slide. So is this one? <clears throat> next one. This one, right? Next one. That that one. Please, if I start to describe this. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, so in this study, as I was saying, uh, we use a spectral being adiabatic. Uh, no. Go back. Previous. Previous slide, please. Danny, you may take over because I cannot hear. I don't know if others have the same problem. Okay. 
I hear you. I hope can you can go hear to the me. next slide. I, now we yeah. hear you perfectly. Just we need the, the slides to be right. <laughs> yeah, just... there is a delay between me and and you. I think. Um, so it's not this this one. It's the next one, right? Right. It's the colorful one. Is it this one? This one, yes. yes. The colorful one. So, as I was saying, uh, we use a spectral being adiabatic parser model developed by Pinsky and, and Hein, and we ran um, the algorithm that we wrote uh, to, of the detection of the microphysical zones on the model data, and here we have the results for the model. <clears throat> so we distinguish here uh, four different aerosol size distribution from uh, uh, pristine to very polluted uh, cases, and uh, we see on all four profiles the condensational growth and the coalescence where the droplets starts to grow beyond the elevated curve. And the main difference is that in the pristine and clean sta states, the algorithm identified the decrease in effective radius as rain out, while uh, on the polluted and very polluted uh, profiles, uh, we see a, a larger decrease that is identified as SAS, a secondary activation zone where we do have an increase of cloud, uh, uh, of cloud droplets, meaning we have um, an activation of the smaller uh, uh, particles. So these are the uh, model results and please go to the next slide. <clears throat> so here is a, a, an example of a real case over the Amazon. And as we can see here, uh, uh, the reality is a bit different than, than the model. Uh, although it's a rather clean case, we see uh, a secondary activation zone here and not a uh, rain out, which means that we have smaller particles that were activated and were invisible to us and to the satellite. And now we can practically see them uh, by their impact on the cloud. And in fact, in most of our cases, we hardly see any rain out indication. And it's mostly, uh, it's just SARS, maybe because in reality, there is rarely rain out without simultaneous uh, SAS that overshadows it. And there is actually activation of smaller particles. Uh, next slide. So to put it in context, um, focusing on the SAS itself can tell us about the existence of ultra fine uh, uh, particles in the cloud that again are invisible uh, to, uh, were invisible until now to the satellite and basically uh, stronger uh, secondary activation uh, leads to more condensation and more latent heat release and greater invigoration and mixed phase particles and eventually more lightning. So uh, what I want to see is the, uh, in, in my whole project is the connection between the secondary activation and the invigoration by using lightning as a, as a proxy. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we move ahead? If you have questions, uh, please put them in the chat. So the next speaker is Johannes Kwas, and the uh, the title is updates on weekly cycles over Europe. Yes, many thanks. So this is really, uh, I have to admit, um, uh, maybe I should have made this more clear. It's a little bit more in the natural laboratories uh, realm, but uh, nevertheless could also be, um, I don't know, interesting um, for everybody who's uh, here in the, uh, in the audience. That was an old study um, now 12 years back. That we looked at the weekly cycle over Europe. Uh, so this is um, Sunday, Monday, etc., to Saturday. And we looked at EMAP observations for the sulfur dioxide, uh, and we saw an approximately 9% um, weekly cycle, um, the amplitude of the weekly cycle. And in SO4, it was a 4% um, weekly cycle, and approximately also in the aerosol optical depth um, from, um, from satellite. Uh, so, um, sorry, you can't see my mouse, obviously. So SO2 is in the left plot, the upper, um, upper row and uh, SO4 is in the left plot, the bottom row, and AOD is in the right plot, the upper row, and then there's cloud droplet number concentration, the middle row, and cloud fraction, the lower row. And the left column always is the observations, which are in the left bit from the EMAP, the Surface Observations Network, and um, on the right it's from MODIS, um, red, Terra, and blue, Aqua, and that was six year, uh, seven years worth of data at that time. 
And then we also did some modeling experiments where we uh, sort of tried to do the detection attribution um, to have a, a model experiment where we had an, an, a cycle and amplitude of about 40% in the ECAM in the HEPGEM model. So at that time, um, pretty noisy results from these seven years of data and in cloud fraction. But nevertheless, I thought it's worth um, to feed that into the paper which um, Matt Christensen and Andrew Gettleman co-lead on the natural, uh, I mean, the ACPC uh, paper on the natural laboratories. And so I had a look at the weekly cycle and update to it. And if you go to the next slide, then you see that. Um, so this is MODIS uh, Aqua and Terra. And on the top left, it's the aerosol optical depth. And on the bottom left, it's the cloud droplet number. And on the right um, top is cloud cover. And on the right bottom is cloud liquid water path. And, um, and that's basically the only result which I want to show, um, which I have so far. Uh, but maybe it's worth uh, digging uh, slightly deeper. And I'll do so hopefully if I have time. Because the interesting thing is, if you now have not seven, uh, but, um, but um, 19 years of data in this plot, then we get a clearer result, which is uh, more consistent in its, um, in its uh, weekly uh, periodicity. And it seems to be that now we have a weekly cycle. It, there seems to be an indication consistent between Terra and Aqua, also in the cloud fraction, which is, of course, instructive because it corroborates the results um, on a positive uh, relationship between cloud drop number and cloud fraction which we saw in a couple of studies and, uh, and also studies um, yeah, involving, involving sort of um, causality by other means. So that was it. Okay, thank you, Johannes. We have time for a quick question. Does anyone have a question for Johannes? Not enough content yet. I have to <laughs> have to come back next year with a little bit more <laughs> process insight, perhaps. Yeah, precipitation would be interesting. Agree. Okay, thank you to Johannes and thank you to all the speakers for um, for keeping so well on time. Um, we had a little bit of technical difficulties there, but we we still have um, uh, we still have about 18 minutes left for discussion. And for that, I'm going to hand it off to Ji Wen to lead the uh, discussion. Okay, so we, we have uh, some questions, probably a lot answered uh, for speakers. Please check if there's questions for you on the chat box. Um, then I think uh, here we are just one. We are open for um, discussion on the. Probably I would think we want to focus on more um, key issues raised, or maybe some more Im some important uh, um, messages from these presentations. So um, I would like to start with, for example, Alex Hai, You know mentioned uh, when you talk about invigoration, you want to define clearly what's the invigoration and, and, and it's convective, which means you, know, you have updraft or buoyancy increase or the cloud in general, like a cloud fraction, cloud top height or precipitation. You know, precipitation is very complicated actually. It's, it's usually you want to look at as a uh, results. Uh, uh, a lot of definition or matrix. Another like thing you mentioned that I think uh, question is the co-variability from like uh, Danny's uh, observational study, meteorological co-variability and the feedback to the environment, the earth impact feedback to the environment. Those are the new thing. I mean, co-variability is not a new thing, but uh, to trying to um, disentangle it, it's, uh, it's a challenge and it would be a new thing. But the feedback to environment, uh, uh, it was not paid much more attention. Uh, now we, yeah, we have this uh, science paper, but uh, yeah, it shows, uh, uh, guy had a very good study, shows, uh, you know, those kind of setup could, uh, you know, lead to 
our, our estimation. And those are the new direction we want to do more study on that, um, about the feedback to the environment. Um, then saturation adjustment in the condensation, those are big issue um, in the aerosol uh, effect on deep convection, you know, convective or class. So those are the things I think I just want to generate information and uh, to get some feedback or comments from you guys. And take it over. Anyone? <laughs> you can raise your hand in the uh, reaction. You can raise it. In the meantime, I want to say uh, this, these questions, it, 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 it was to, uh, well to see what uh, the questions can be addressed in the framework of the measurements uh, of tracer. For example, the feedback to the environment, how the air mass uh, uh, is changed uh, upwind and, and downwind of the convection. Yes, good point. We, we will think about uh, the, that. I mean, with all the modeling studies being presented as well, what extra observations do we also need to back up those modeling studies? And again, we will actually talk a little bit about this uh, tomorrow, but you know, we always seem to have this case. We kind of have a distinct modeling studies, distinct observational studies, and I'm looking forward to seeing ones that are better coupled. Not, not to diminish in any manner the cool talks we saw this morning, of course. Yes. That's what we also, uh, you know, the chaser would feel in the role. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> we are look forward a lot uh, for chaser field campaign. Yeah. And if I may uh, also raise the, the, the suggestion is um, we can always use forward operator to compare directly with the uh, radar observation. Um, yeah. So that's something I will show actually <laughs> in half an hour, um, the climatology. So, you know, an apple to apple comparison is always welcome. Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, particularly also, I think we also have studies, for example, from uh, Daniel's study shows there's a lot clear increase in the updrafts and the latent heat by the aerosols in the same uh, from the simulations they did. So this is uh, interesting. And uh, also maybe we can also seek for some answers from observations <laughs> from Chaser. And also it's it will be interesting to also look at uh, other simulations. You know, um, Rallo, I think from the chat box, uh, then you said, uh, um, maybe Danny, you can say a little bit more um, about the simulations you, do, you just did. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Well, I, I'd rather uh, talk about it when we publish it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm the other Daniel, not you, is about the, uh, the, 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 model, the model simulations. I think Daniel from- uh, Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, right, right, right. I think that was- <laughs> Yeah, so the so these we, we we only use one model, so we're using NUWARF. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the the good thing is we have a lot of simulations with different aerosol concentrations, but the it would be interesting to look at other models, of, of course, and other microphysics schemes as well. Yeah. We, we are just using one microphysics scheme there. Yeah. So you use P3, right? P3, right. Yeah. yeah. So the book of microphysics is probably um, still. The condensation with evaporation, still saturation adjustment uh, uh, approach. Yeah, I think so. I'm not. I, I, I'm not so familiarized with the details, but I think that it's that's the case. Yeah. Yeah, it will be very interesting. We can provide our spectral beam simulations to you. Yeah. Yeah. That, <laughs> that, that, that would be the same results. Yeah. But yeah, right. but Daniel Daniel, this is Graham. That doesn't make sense because you showed plots of supersaturation in your talk. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, I'm not so sure. So you, you, you can still have a bulk scheme and solve the supersaturation equation. And so apparently that's what you have there. Uh, yeah, in P3, actually, I, 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 have, uh, um, I worked on P3 um, for um, quite a bit. It's, uh, 
it's a lot of purely uh, saturation adjustment. It has some time, uh, de in, uh, time dependent, um, but it's still kind of adjust. You do have a uh, super saturation generally, but uh, it's much lower. I will not uh, have a super saturation as you have a, a fully prognostic super saturation equation. It's still, it's a, uh, it's just break down into different uh, time steps, sub time steps to do the adjustment. Still, a lot dependent on errors or on uh, drop in number yet. Yeah, thank you, Joan. I think that you, you know better how it works than I do. <laughs> okay, um, any other comments? We have a lot from the chat. Jiwen, Jiwen, I guess I'll just say, um, I think that there's a lot of these things we can get at with Tracer, um, but, but it's gonna take all these different approaches to kind of tackle this problem some. Um, you know, Danny showed some very nice results there where he's looking at uh, long, long time periods, lots of cases from satellite observations. So you can really beat down some of the uncertainties with the statistics in those cases. At Tracer, we're taking the approach where we're going to take as many measurements as we possibly can to try to beat down that uncertainty, but, but we're never gonna get rid of all of that. So we need both of those observational approaches. We need multi-model studies uh, like, the, like the MIP, the ACPC MIP, but, um, but probably more than that also to, to, to really bring all the different diversity we have to this, this problem because the, a lot of the measurement uncertainties and modeling uncertainties are larger than the signal where we're trying to define. Um, so I guess I wanna emphasize that all of the different work we're seeing is an important component of uh, you know, what ACPC should be doing moving forward. Yes, definitely. Um, particularly, I would encourage you know today and in this session we have observational people present nice work. We have modelers present very nice work. So I hope this will you know, facilitate the, the observations and the model the work together. You know, this is a, a chance is a really a good opportunity. And the way I also have this uh, modeling um, group, which I and Sue we we you know organize and this uh, would be the sense uh, um, you know we can identify priorities although we cannot solve all the problem and but yeah I, I think uh, I, I, we should identify our priorities I mean the ones which we feel we really can work together um, for example we can track the same as updraft, those things probably is our first target. And, and then the macrophysical effect um, versus the, the feedback to dynamics, those are more complicated. Like the feedback effect is much more complicated. So we, we yes, for different science question, we actually need a very different uh, design from model, from both model and also observations actually. So this uh, really requires both observationist and the model work together. So Jiwen, maybe in that vein, um, I think we must um, keep everybody reminded on this. And this was, I think some discussion in the chat too that we were talking with Daniel about that, you know, we have this great set of modeling tools now in the MIP, and we've only just started digging into it. You know, we've got several papers coming out on it now, but it's a tremendous, tremendous data source that I think we can all dig into. It's available to everybody who wants to use it. You know, it's open and good to go. So I know a lot of work is being done in getting ready for Trace on that, and we'll see a little bit more of this tomorrow, but it's, I just wanted to put that out as a reminder to everybody that, you know, those data are available there and um, encourage people to look into, into, into that data set. It's a, it's a tremendous resource. Thank you, Sue. Yes, that, a good, that is a good point. And a lot of effort has been put in in this modeling studies. 
and there's a lot we can get out from it. Yeah. So can I maybe just briefly add to it? It's a great point. Um, I think what we should really maybe encourage the community to think if they want to analyze the data and maybe put a little bit on the web page where people could submit a, a half page or something, mm -hmm. um, what they want to do when they want to do it so that we avoid overlap, not everyone digging in and doing the same kind of okay. analysis. Yeah, so that's, then, a good, that's a good point, Philip, absolutely. So. Um, and maybe that's something we can talk about at some point. I don't know whether now or today or tomorrow, or, you know, the kinds of things where people think they might, might go with this. But yeah, that's a that's a good point to ensure that, yeah, we make the maximum benefit of the data set as opposed to all focusing on one thing. Yeah. Agreed. Just as an update as well, we have secured uh, 100 terabytes worth of space uh, at Oak Ridge's um, the ARM data center, which is connected to the uh, Oak Ridge leadership computing facility as well as 50,000 core hours on their machine as well. That's kind of as an initial start. So I'm in the middle of setting all that up. So we will have a space to keep everything together and it'll be co-located with the ARM archive at the same time. So we can do all that compute in the same place. So I do actually think that if you're looking at the, the past ACPC experiences is going and with the UK computing center we use there, whose name I can't recall, I'm, a, I'm sorry. That will be the focus. That actual bringing all that data together, I think will help coordinate a lot of these analysis activities. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for get that space from ARM. <laughs> 100 yeah, yeah, yeah. terabytes. It's, it's, it's going to be a process. I'm working with them to try and make access for other people as easy as possible because they're still working out what we look like in terms of a group and and how we do it you know you know joe and you've been in the lab you know you know how we have to kind of get it as secure, unsecure as possible say no not everyone really needs multi-factor authentication and so on and so forth so we're working through that there'll be more news on that soon yes it will be uh, great uh, for for the chase mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, collaboration mm. on, on this data yeah it's really great for ACPC and for all of us. I appreciate it very much. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to Sorry. Okay, Jian go ahead. Yes, I just want to say uh, we have uh, talked a lot of data from ARM, um, from you know, satellite. I just wonder, we should have also international coordinated effort of all other field campaigns by other countries. Certainly, you know, Europe and also Asia, China in particular, they are also compiling large data set from many different field campaigns. So that might be helpful. I wonder if there's any such internationally coordinated effort for putting field campaign data together or under a common umbrella so that we can all access to it. Mm, did you 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 ask uh, the question if anyone knows that? Uh, did you know yeah, anyone? Yeah, I wonder if for ACPC or other um, program, you know, put effort to get uh, more than just the U.S. Uh, arm field campaigns. There are many other field campaigns also existing. So I just think we should have an uh, effort uh, to do that too, because after all, the also effects depend very much on the meteorology and aerosol in the region where they are really strong, you know, so that uh, the arm may not cover all the important regions, you know. I, I know China National Science Foundation is sponsoring a program like that for putting together data in China, but I'm sure also other regions in India, uh, also other places have such a uh, field campaign as well. So that's my suggestion. We should have uh, an initiative on that too. Mm. That's something for ACPC uh, leadership uh, initiative. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, we may think about uh, international effort, um, put this uh, particularly uh, all you know all the relevant uh, field campaign together the data. Uh, I mean, I, I know actually there's a one effort from Europe uh, about the us. Um, as like a color properties, they actually collect all of the field campaigns, relevant, relevant field campaigns, 
has the measurements in the S cloud as number, you know, as particle number, as particle, uh, as well content. And that was a very useful data sets. And, and people, users only can, they can get all you know, data from just one location and they can get the data at the different locations. Um, this is very useful, particularly for, for those people who work on the global model. They probably want to evaluate, to look at not just one place. Yeah, something to think about maybe to Danny and Minghua. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we definitely need to start thinking about uh, the, the stage after the tracer uh, and we would appreciate very much uh, ideas uh, please send to us. Okay, so I think we have, uh, it is time. I mean, actually it's, uh, so now, um, uh, I think, Michael, do we want to take a photo? I think we have yes. 81 people. It's much less than the peak. The peak time is uh, 91 people. That's 10 yeah, people. We're still, doing, we're still doing pretty good. So yes, I think uh, we're at our break time. I think um, we should take a picture of everyone first. So um, if folks can um, turn their cameras on. And, uh, and smile, and if some other people can do screen grabs also, but I'll. Uh... When you're done, then that's <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I've got it. Good. Okay. So then I think uh, may, uh, we may end the session now. Um, and thank you for all of the speakers and um, for those who participate, participate in the discussion and chat. Thank you. And uh, we have a 15 minutes break. And then after that, uh, we have the second session. See you then. Thank you. You may stay on that. Uh, it's okay. Uh, oh, you you want to knock out, then knock back.
Okay. Who is, uh, who is running the show now? Yue, are you are you there? Yue is there, yeah. And the Philip? Just the timekeeper. Okay. Philip, yeah. Uh, Marcus? And then Scott Collins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Marcus is a uh, is uh, um no Marcus, you on? I did see him uh, when we took the photos. Do not see him in the list right now. Is it 45? Okay, it's 46, so he should be on. Yeah, um, way you may start, and uh, I can yep. try to take loads. Uh, maybe yep. Scott also can help if, uh, well, uh, yeah. So, you way you're muted. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Um, so the first speaker is uh, Ji Wen Fan, and uh, her talk uh, her talk title is uh, "Aerosol Impacts on Severe Convective Storm and Hail." Go ahead. Okay. Um, who is the take? Uh, Philip, you are sharing, or I think Philip is the second share. You wait, you 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 need to share the whole screen. It's it's not the whole screen yet. Um, do control L, it might work. Control L. Uh -huh. Or maybe just go to your Com command L on a Mac. Mm -hmm. Command L. Uh, you where you have Mac or Windows? Oh, Mac. Mac. I think that right now it's already the maximum. Nope. No, it's locked. It's not. Because uh, it's in my... it's command L. Yeah, actually, I use the command L. Maybe it's just a delay or something. Did you share the window or your screen? Uh, share the screen. Okay, well, you should be able to make it full screen usually, but um, if not, just hit the. Philip, Philip, hit can the, you share? Hit the little right. Hit the little right arrow on the side. It'll go bigger. You can get rid of the side. The sidebar on the right. Hit that little arrow right there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Rue, you can stop share. Let Philip share. Philip says he can share. Okay. Oh, he said my light, his light work is dropping. Okay, then King. I suggested I'm not the safest bet to share. I, I would go with, with someone else because yeah, I'll my just network say. just me out. <laughs> okay. Um you where can you share or you you if you can't uh, I'll open to see if I can share. That should work. That's almost full screen. Yeah, yeah, okay. This this should be good. Um, if you have issues as well, I have the slides ready now. Okay, I suggest that you do you go ahead with yours. Okay, um, let me. I don't know what's wrong with my screen. Okay, uh, yeah, I just thought. Okay, um, yes, I will. Um, talk about every impact on severe convective storms and the hail. Uh, my co-authors are listed here. Uh, I particularly want to thank Yu Wei, uh, Zhang, and Yu Ning. Next. Severe convective storms and the, the attendant with hazel, particularly hail, 
caused substantial poverty and economic losses. This is an increased trend. Arison can impact the through enhanced updraft velocity and also enhanced ship code droplets uh, and then enhanced uh, uh, recycling for large hair growth as shown in the left uh, fig, uh, right figure. Here, I want to showcase that how aerosol from wildfires and the organization affect hair through the joint so John, with all the changes. So I, I see the first slide again. You wait, what happened? Is anybody else show the first? Oh, sorry. Sorry. I think it's my screen. It's pump up. <laughs> I was trying to open the file. And now it's pump up uh, a big window, <laughs> cover everything. OK, yeah. No problem from your side. Um, so what I meant about our company factors is that the wildfire, besides emit aerosol, it also emit a lot of uh, heat. For organization, besides the aerosols, we also have a change in the land use land cover. Next. Okay, so um, for the wildfire, we, uh, the impact on the severe convective stones and hell is not much studied yet. So we have this uh, uh, report you know, on Australia 2020 wildfire. Well, after that, we have this baseball size hail happening. So are they related a lot? Um, so based on my study on the central United States, well, I can show you there might be some correction uh, that they might be related. So what I focus is the uh, severe convective stones and the hail in the central United States, which has a local fire from uh, Colorado, Wyoming. And then they also can be impacted by the remote fires from the West US. So um, the heat impact was usually generally um, mixed, uh, mixed, I mean, uh, yeah, ignored uh, in many models, such as in Wolf Camp. Next. So um, then on the PyQ, uh, here I want to show what fire can, how it would impact the hair from PyQ. And then, the, we build this model capability to allow the model to computationally efficiently simulate the PyRQ in WolfCam by developing the heat flux parameters, then applied to this case, Texas Monad fire case. This is a, a fire in trigger huge um, PyRQ produce a lot of hair and uh, lightning. So here the main point is that both the heat, the heat and aerosol from wildfires contribute to the, the uh, formation of the large hair, larger than two centimeters a lot. And then um, both contribute significantly for the aerosol. Uh, it, it contributes less, but as the stone involves, it contributes uh, much more. And they have a nonlinear amplification uh, impact when they work together. Next. So then here we applied this uh, model, new model into the long term period, which is a weak period, uh, a weak wildfire period. This uh, has, we have wildfires from Western US in California, we have local wildfires. Um, we use two domains and to simulate the, uh, the both local uh, remote effect um, what we find, uh, those, there's four storms during this period, four significant severe storms, which produce hails during this time period. So what we find is that the total wildfire impact increased the accumulated rain by 19%. But for the moderate rain rate, for example, 10 to 20 millimeter per hour, and also the heavy rain rate larger than 20 millimeter per hour, their frequencies are increased by uh, 65%. And then the, yeah, because it's not the full screen, I think it's caught in the bottom. 
and uh, for the for the hair, the significant sphere hair, which is larger than five, uh, five centimeter, the increase is about uh, um, 34%. Next, please. So what we also found that uh, it is mainly because the remote effect, uh, they have a larger effect compared to the local wildfire. So the remote effect contributed to um, 53% of the total accumulated rain increase, local contributed only 32%. And then for the hail, the remote effect contributed 65 of the total increase in the significant severe hail occurrence, a local effect contributed to the only 25%. So this actually means fire flung California contributed more significantly to the hail in the central United States. Next, please. Okay. About the urbanization, so we also, there's not much attention on the urbanization impact on the weather hazard. We here, I would just want to show the show a case that uh, how the over aerosol and the overnight change from the Kansas City organization impacted the supercell and their hair. So the results I want to emphasize here is in the mid panel. It's about uh, the hair. So um, in the there's four groups. In the middle two groups, the it's about the separate effect from the overland and the over aerosol. You can see their impact is not that much. It's not, not large. But if you look at the joint impact, which is the first group, for both severe hair and the significant severe hair, their increase is about 20%. So, which means when this, the overall aerosol and the overland effect work together, they produce a large nonlinear amplification. Next, please. So, the mechanism here, uh, time wise, I just quickly mentioned that. Uh, this is mainly because it enhanced the updraft velocity for the strong updrafts and also the supercooled liquid, particularly they enhanced the supercooled droplet number, but they, drop, they decreased the droplet size, which allows more running growth through uh, enhanced uh, the recycling. Well, what we found mm -hmm. is that each hair in Bore uh, experienced more running growth. Next. Two minutes, Chivin. Yeah. Oh, you're there. Perfect. Yes, I'm there. <laughs> so, yeah, what we here, what we found is that so aerosol from wildfire can enhance large hail occurrences through local and the remote effect, and the remote effect even larger uh, compared to the local wildfire effect. So, Aerosol from organization can also enhance the large hair occurrences, particularly through the uh, amplific amplification work together with the overland effect. So here actually both study, I want to highlight that uh, the significant joint effect of aerosol with the accompanying changes. Because when we talk about wildfire and the organization, there's a lot of just aerosol change. So when they work together, this nonlinear amplification is very important and can be very large. Thank you. Happy to answer any questions. Do you have time for questions, Philip? 30 seconds, only a very quick one. I mean, there's a, a very quick, quick one, question by Steve. Quick one from, yeah, from Stephen Salesby. Could the remote effect be larger due to aerosol aging, perhaps becoming more soluble over time? Thank you. Yes, that's a good question. Uh, they actually, what we found is that uh, uh, both the meteorology change and the aerosol contribute significantly, not just aerosol. The remote fire from uh, California changed the meteorology, actually changed the convergences. So, uh, the, and the aerosol indeed um, play, played a very important role um, about the aging, we uh, with wolf can yes we use the wolf can we can look about look about more uh, in that but along the transport yes you do well how we age aging 
the effect could be. Thank you. Okay, next um, speaker is Mini Park. Um, the title is uh, Environmental Modulation of Aerosol Impacts on Tropical Sea Breeze Convection. Mini, take, care. Yeah. Uh, take, take over. Yeah, so thank you, Yue, um, for the introduction. Um, before I get going, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author, um, Sue Vandenheber at Colorado State University. Next, please. So the goal of this study is to examine how aerosol impacts on convective updrafts within tropical seabreeze flow regimes vary as a function of a wide range of environments. So as listed in the table on the right side, uh, we have 10 parameters to create perturbed parameter ensembles. And the 10 parameters include initial thermodynamic uh, conditions, including boundary layer and inversion layer, um, and zonal wind velocity, as well as the surface characteristics over the ocean and interactive rainforest surfaces. And these 10 parameters are simultaneously perturbed using the maximum inlet and hypercube sampling method. So as a result, we only need 130 perturbed parameter combinations to cover the 10 dimensional parameter space. Then we incorporate a statistical emulation technique to estimate the model outputs of interest at untested parameter combinations, and eventually to conduct a 10-dimensional um, sensitivity analysis. So and it should be emphasized that with only 130 initial conditions, we actually examine more than 59,000 initial conditions in theory. Next slide, please. Here we use the RAMS model uh, coupled to a two-way interactive land surface model. As displayed in the upper right corner, the left half of the domain is rainforest and the other half of the domain is ocean with fixed sea surface temperature. Here to examine the impacts of increased, increased aerosol loading, we choose submicron ammonium sulfate aerosols that strongly scatter solar radiation. And using 130 um, initial conditions where 10 different parameters were perturbed, we conduct 130 idealized uh, Seabrew simulations under relatively low and high aerosol loading. In total, so we have uh, 260 simulations. Uh, as shown in the bottom figure, bottom right figure, the initial vertical profile of ammonium sulfate um, is presented. And these two aerosol loadings are color coded by blue and red throughout the top. Next, please. So before getting into the results showing the difference between low and high aerosol loading, I'd like to show you, uh, show you an example of convective development from one of our uh, ensemble members. So in this figure, only part of the rainforest uh, domain is shown. And as marked uh, with an orange arrow on top panel, the sea breeze propagates from the coastline to further inland during the daytime. And the direction of sea breeze propagation is from the east to the west. And next, as highlighted in the mixed, uh, mid middle level, with daytime land surface heating, boundary layer mix res uh, mixing results in boundary layer convection um, and clouds ahead of the seabrush front. And these clouds are uh, marked by shallower clouds, weaker updrafts, and lighter precipitation. Then those clouds develop focused along the seabrush convergence. Meanwhile, um, the seabrush initiated convection um, is well characterized at the bottom panel in this figure. So in this example case, a seabreeze initiated convection is deep convection. However, it should be noted that in our ent entire ensemble, the majority of seabreeze convection is shallow. Next slide, please. So in the previous slide, I showed you uh, the convective development with deep seabreeze initiated convection. And here, uh, as shown in the left three panels, uh, these show an example where seabreeze initiated convection remains shallow. Still, the convection along the seabrush convergence is stronger and deeper than uh, the convection ahead of it. Next slide, please. So now let's move on to the results section where the percentage difference between uh, pristine and polluted ensembles is presented. So in this slide, we look at the uh, three convective ingredients over the rainforest area, particularly ahead of the um, identified seabrush front during the afternoon. So in these three line plots, the X axis marks the simulation ID number from one to 130, and the Y axis represent the percentage different the pristine and polluted um, scenarios. So first uh, in the upper right corner, um, 
mean latent heat flux is uh, uh, is shown, and it's uh, and it is decreased with enhanced aerosol loading in all simulations, meaning less moisture being available to convective development. In a similar manner, mixed layer depths representing low level instability of the environment and the maximum zebras extent, which is indicative of zebras lift, are all decreased with more aerosol. So altogether, increased aerosol results in a robust reduction of convective ingredients, regardless of different initial conditions. Next, please. So bar graphs in this figure um, indica uh, indicate the relative importance of 10 different parameters that we perturb the initial that uh, in the initial conditions on updrafts, uh, particularly associated with uh, boundary layer convection ahead of zebra's convergence. So 10 different colors uh, in the bottom, uh, bottom left um, represent 10 different parameters perturbed in, it, uh, perturbed in the initial conditions again. So as color in gray in both bar graphs, soil saturation fraction exerts the most control over the boundary layer convective updrafts. However, when you compare the left and right bar, uh, bar graphs, um, which means compare the pristine and the polluted results, you can see that the relative importance of soil saturation fraction decreases from 78% uh, to 68 with enhanced aerosol loading. Next, please. And further looking into the relative importance of soil saturation fraction, or in other words, soil moisture on the boundary layer convection, this decrease from polluted uh, pristine to polluted is shown in uh, different soil regimes from dry to wet soil. And, the, uh, and this decrease from uh, pristine uh, to polluted is uh, pronounced uh, in dry and mid soil com uh, compared to the, uh, the wet soil. And this can be attributed to enhanced scattering of incoming solar radiation, which reduces surface fluxes and the contribution of soil moisture to the surface fluxes with enhanced aerosol loading. Uh, in the contrast, the relative importance of soil moisture does not exist over the, uh, the wet soil regimes, uh, as shown in the right uh, bar graphs. Furthermore, it is very interesting that this decrease is the most pronounced in the mid-soil regimes than extremely dry or uh, extremely wet soil regime. Next, please. So finally, here we compare the uh, maximum cloud top height between pristine and polluted conditions. So now we are focused on the convection along the Seabris convergence line, whereas we uh, look at the convection ahead of it um, in the previous slides. So um, here the, we chose the maximum cloud top height to represent the Seabris initiated convection. Um, so overall, as shown in the line plot in the bottom or, or in two uh, panel figures in the left side, the maximum cloud top height is uh, um, decreased with enhanced aerosol loading. Um, especially for 12 cases where dip convection develops along the Seabrus convergence under the pristine scenario. Um, only, uh, and five of them are uh, absent of dip convection under the polluted scenario marked with black arrows on the top figure. So it also turned out the seven initial conditions that produce dip convection under both scenarios have higher initial bond, uh, boundary layer potential temperature as a common factor. Again, our results demonstrate the role of aerosol uh, direct effect on convection within a wide range of tropical seabirds regimes. Good so, morning. and uh, yeah, and more results regarding the dip convective cases will be presented at the end of today's session by Sue. Next, please. So here we look at the aerosol impact on a wide range of tropical seabirds convective system, and it shows a very consistent um, uh, consistent, responsive, regardless of the initial conditions. And uh, with the summary here, thank you for your attention. I'd like to take any questions or comments you may have. Thank you. We have no questions in the chat as yet. So uh, if we have time, Phil, I'll ask one very quick question, which is, did you investigate the role of wind shear at all? So here we only con uh, we did not consider the wind shear uh, for the complicity. So in the initial profile of the wind, uh, it, there is no wind shear, so it's vertically um, homogeneous at the uh, very beginning of simulations. Thank you. Right, future work might be interesting to look at also the role of cold pools and things like that that are generated. You, you cited Doswell, and that made me think of RKW theory that kind of came afterward from Jeff Trapp and that group. So very cool stuff. Yeah. So uh, speaking of cold pools, like. Uh, uh, 
there is an ongoing um, analysis regarding the precipitation and cultural properties uh, regarding yeah. this ensembles. Very nice work. Great. I think we should move on. Okay, the next speaker is uh, Yuan Wang, and uh, his title is Distinctive, uh, Distinctive uh, Effects of Aerosols on uh, Tropical Cyclones. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me good? Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity uh, to present our recent work. Um, so, yeah, so aerosol has uh, quite different ways to impact the tropical cyclones. Uh, through interaction with radiation and the uh, seed crop as INCCN. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to um, talk about the CCN effect. I would like to acknowledge my, uh, the contribution from my co-author, um, uh, Bo Wen Pan. Uh, now she's a postdoc at uh, Colorado State University working with Sue and uh, Renee Zhang from Texas and m University. Um, next slide, please. So uh, we have some uh, uh, observational evidence of aerosol impact on tropical cyclone, um, although they are quite limited. Um, so one recent study by John et al, uh, they analyzed uh, tropical uh, uh, TC re uh, related rainfall using trim satellite and uh, they focus on the Northwest Pacific region in which is the most uh, popular uh, TC regions. And uh, in their analysis, uh, they first uh, try to remove the, the environmental factors like uh, sea surface temperature uh, through a linear regression method. And you can see uh, the very interesting thing is the size of the tropical rainfall tend to be larger when you uh, run into a more polluted uh, regime. And also, uh, if you look at the, um, the, the rainfall distribution, it seems to um, uh, indicate that the, the, the precipitation also shift towards the uh, outer rain band. Uh, next slide, please. So I think we have a uh, very good understanding about such a phenomena. Uh, a lot of study using either a model or theoretical framework to, uh, and to interpret um, the CC effect on the TC rainfall and the uh, TC intensity. So one uh, hypothesis here is um, when aerosols penetrate into a storm from outside, it first uh, run into the rain band and it will invigorate the collection in rain band. And the meanwhile, uh, the invigorate collection can consume a lot of uh, energy and the moisture and instability that will uh, cut off the energy inflow to the eye wall, which will uh, eventually reduce um, uh, intensity over the, the collection intensity over the eye wall. And my own model simulation of uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina also confirms such a hypothesis. And uh, yeah, the previous study by Ken and uh, Danny's work uh, already also points to the same conclusion. Next slide, please. Uh, however, if you look into the uh, literatures, you still see quite a diverse uh, magnitude um, and even the sign of the CC effect on uh, tropical cyclones. I think there are many other factors at play. Uh, first, uh, each tropical cyclone is different. Uh, the structure is different. Uh, how, the, uh, how the energy uh, was uh, like flowing to the eye wall is quite different. So uh, those factors need to be considered. And also, um, we have to think about how aerosol um, get transported if they can get into the eye wall and the invigorate collections there. And uh, if you have uh, sources, additional sources for aerosols uh, in the eye wall or uh, over the rain band. And our recent study also uh, suggests that there's a stirring uh, effect from the ocean dynamic feedback. The so ECMA transport will uh, give you some upwelling and uh, that will consider as additional feedback to the uh, tropical intensity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, recently, there's a golden case, uh, which is a Hurricane Harvey in uh, 2017. I call it a golden case because first, uh, it produced an uh, unprecedented amount of precipitation in the Houston metropolitan areas. Uh, within a couple of days, uh, it dumped precipitation like uh, more than 15 inches and uh, caused a, a catastrophic flooding uh, in that area. And also, uh, if you look at the NOAA uh, operational model, their forecast totally miss such a high uh, level of precipitation, even though they get their 
PC track uh, and intensity right in the uh, prediction. And another aspect interesting is um, if you look at the MODIS AOD right before the uh, first landfall of the uh, Harvey, uh, as I show you below, uh, the AOD spatial distribution here is somewhat resembles the, the precipitations. Um, one thing which can be in mind that uh, in this air, Area, it's a lot of uh, refineries and the petrochemical facilities, and all of these facilities uh, didn't close until like two days after the uh, Harvey's first landfall. So uh, there's potential huge uh, amount of um, aerosol uh, produced locally. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here I want to show you uh, some very uh, abnormal and uh, very severe lightning events. Uh, I have a cartoon here, but I don't think it can be played. So it, it shows you radar reflectivity, actually uh, the hot spot uh, right over the center of the, um, the, the, the refineries in the Houston industrial area. And, um, and also on uh, August 27th, we see a very uh, interesting hot spot of the lightning um, captured by the lightning detection network. And uh, so next slide, please. And uh, we spent a lot of effort to get this um, uh, events uh, simulated uh, and make it a comparison, uh, make it a comparable with observations. So the efforts include, we have a three nested domain and the innermost one is a vortex falling and also we conduct a WARF uh, simulation, simulation run, a 3 dr simulation, uh, which is simulating all sky infrared radiance from the GEO satellite. And we then uh, branch out the sensitivity run from that uh, uh, simulating run. So we update our sea surface temperature on a daily basis. And um, also we perform um, ensemble simulations. We perturb the initial conditions slightly for each sensitivity run. And for each emission scenarios, uh, we have five ensemble members. So, so we want to uh, beat down the, the model internal variability. And our aerosol budget are prog uh, prognostic and uh, we are using uh, the two mobile bulk microphysical scheme developed at Texas A&M University, uh, which, is, um, uh, which has um, uh, the, the, the prognostic uh, super saturation as well. Uh, so we, we won't encounter any issues like uh, saturation adjustments. And um, our uh, emission setup, like say, is we have a polluted case, which is higher initial aerosol concentration. And meanwhile, we spe specify some uh, emission sources over the Houston to mimic the aerosol from the industrial sources. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our, oh, okay. Uh, here's our, um, modeled uh, hurricane hurry track and intensity essentially uh, is we can reproduce the evolution of the hurricane uh, after the landfall and uh, its further dissipation stage and the, the, the TC track is uh, also quite um, uh, well simulated and uh, interestingly in this case we do not see quite different uh, change in the hurricane intensities between P case and the, the, the Plut case and the clean case. Next slide, please. Uh, however, uh, if you look at precipitation and lightning, the model shows quite a dramatic response. Uh, on the left, I'm showing you the observations. On the right are the uh, clean case, Plut case, and the differences. You can see that only the Plut case can capture the, the intensity and the, the spatial distribution of the precipitation very well. And we have a um, lightning detection, uh, lightning potential index uh, diagnostic from the WARF model output. And we can uh, also see that the lightning uh, activities has been largely enhanced uh, due to the aerosols. Next slide, please. And uh, yeah, for the accumul accumulated precipitations uh, by the end of the events, we see the Pluto case give us um, a factor of two increase of the precipitation. So we are quite surprised at the time when we see the results, but uh, it is what the model tells us. Um, 
And another thing I want to emphasize is uh, the color shading here indicates the spread between ensemble members. We want to argue the aerosol effect really be down the, uh, the ensemble spread. Next slide, please. And here uh, we, uh, we explain what happened uh, for the Harvey, uh, the aerosol effect. Uh, essentially, we see both a warm cloud invigoration and mixed phase cloud invigoration. So the warm cloud invigoration can be seen by the change of the supersaturation. The, uh, the water vapor mixing ratio here, you can see the, the peak is actually is much uh, smaller because the aerosol can uh, consume a lot of supersaturation and uh, bring the uh, suppression, uh, the, the water vapor mixing ratio to a lower level. And um, the above the freezing level, you see the, a, lo a lot of ice Hydromedias are formed, including both uh, snow and uh, and the uh, ground post. Next slide, please. Um, and we're, we're over time. We should probably wrap up soon. Okay, sure. This, this is my last slide. So uh, this is uh, the the latent heat change and vertical velocity change. They all echo the the change of the hydrometers and uh, the water vapor budget. And next slide uh, is my summary slide. So yeah, essentially we call for more. Um, consideration of aerosol effect in the hurricane operational models. And th those are important for the future hurricane pr pr prediction and projection. Uh, that's it, thank you. Great, thanks. I suggest we take questions in the chat because we're, we're a bit, quite a bit over time already. Thank you very much. Okay, next speaker is Jia Xi Hu, and he's going to talk about clim uh, climatology of the vertical profiles of uh, polarimetric uh, radar arrivals and uh, retrieve the microphysical parameters in tropical cyclone hurricanes and uh, continental and uh, uh, maritime MCS. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, Alexander and Tong Fei, and we're all from Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, next slide, please. So our motivation uh, lies in the uh, depolarization radars capability really enhance our ability to retrieve uh, microphysical parameters. And I'm gonna show you the, um, something you're very interested in, like mean volume diameter, total number concentration, ice water count, liquid water counting. And we believe using those uh, parameters to optimize the models is the uh, new frontier of work. And um, you, know, you can use the forward, uh, uh, forward operator for both spin scheme and box schemes. Um, how can, uh, can you replicate them uh, from the radar observation? And we always believe that a reliable radar microphysical retrieval uh, is very important for the optimization. Um, you know, a lot of people only use like um, reflectivity only independent dependent ice water counting, which could significantly underestimate the uh, um, cases when they have only like high concentration of small ice crystal. And the polar depolarization really helps to solve those problems. Um, and we have been always working with a lot of uh, different groups from in situ measurements. Um, flight measurements and uh, campaigns to update our equations for the retrievals. And so far it's been proving pretty uh, promising. And the current, you know, polymetric WSR ADAD radar network within the United States really provides this unique opportunity to build this climatology of radar and microphysical patterns. Uh, next, please. So there are two things we're very interested in. One thing is the background states of all those storms, MCS and hurricanes. And, by, and how do we obtain that with radar? is we use this called the range-defined quasi vertical profile or called RDQVP introduced by Toby and Crimson. Uh, it's basically fixed on a particular radar and use a certain range. I'm using 50 kilometer radius and use all the available vertical, uh, vertical angles to construct a very fine vertical uh, pattern in, uh, and create a time series. On the right-hand side, you see the pattern of all the important uh, parameters uh, like the panel A in reflectivity, you see a nice decreasing pattern above, uh, say six kilometer above, and the, the increasing pattern down below, suggesting a murmuring. And by the way, this is also for Harvey, uh, but in the in the Iowa region. And um, and panel B and panel D, you see the differential reflectivity and the cross correlation coefficient showing the nice uh, melting layer between 4.5 to five kilometer. And panel C, the KDP gave you the idea of uh, concentrations of pristine eyes, and you see the big, large pockets of enhanced KDP uh, about the melting layer. And, and all those uh, um, retrievals I'll talk later, just in terms of time. Next, please. And, and we're also very interested in not just the background, but also the high ice water counting areas. 
But, but this is a moving object, moving area. We have to use a different technique called the column vertical profile. You can think of this as a, another kind of RDQVP, but rather it is a moving and not fixed on the radar. And though we, I usually take a 20 degree by 20 kilometer um, box and still using all the available elevation angles to construct the vertical profiles. And, and we can use that to track the high ice water content in time. And on the right hand side, the similar similar figure. Uh, it is not as smooth as the RDQVP because it's not uh, average as much. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I don't have the time to show you the tracking, but they have to trust me that we can do a very robust track tracking for the high ice water path. Uh, on, the, on the left is an example. So for each location, we will keep record of the what's inside the CVP box for all the uh, problematic variables and the retrievals. And in the end, we will construct the CFAS uh, on the right-hand side. This is from purely from radar observations. And so far, we have been doing this for uh, 13 continental MCSs and 10 marine MCSs and 11 hurricane tropical cyclones, which, I'll, which is the main result I'm gonna show you in the next page, please. Next page, please. yeah. And uh, so this is the main, first main result, uh, is the background state of RDQ by using RDQVP and the marine is in blue and hurricane is in green and the continental is in red. And the first thing you see from the panel A is that reflectivity from continental is much larger than hurricane and marine. And why is that is basically because marine uh, MCS usually have larger hydrometers throughout the whole column. And this is also true for the ZDR below in the panel B, the ZDR below the melting layer when it's liquid. And remember ZDR is only the, logarithmic difference between horizontal and vertical. So when it's liquid, it's more oblate and it's more it's larger than ADR. But once it's going above, in, in the red line, by the way, uh, once it's above the melting layer, it decreases dramatically because first of all, uh, more spherical uh, in the continental cases, uh, hydrometers, and also the lower density aggregates in the continental will also significantly decrease the ADR compared with the other uh, two marine time storms. Uh, and the other thing uh, interesting here is you look at the grain line, which is a hurricane, you see the reflectivity in panel A is relatively smaller than the continental, but the KDP in panel C is larger. And that suggests a smaller, but maybe more concentration uh, of smaller ice in the, in the hurricanes. And that is uh, again, supported by panel D and E uh, in the retrievals of DM and NT. You see the size of the hurricane is much smaller than the continental and the concentration of NT in panel E, in the green line is much larger and the panel E is in logarithmic scale. So it's, it is quite different. And what's also interesting here is that the ice water content uh, in the uh, ice water content in uh, hurricane and Continental is pretty similar in, 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 in ice phase and larger than the marine time. So this is uh, something very interesting and we quantify this in the background state uh, of different kinds of MCSs uh, and hurricanes. And next slide, please. So, the, and, and we're also interested in what, what happened to the high ice water count in the area. And I want to pay special attention in panel C first, uh, which it, you know, it is characterized by the high KDP uh, above six kilometer is three times larger than the background state from the RDQVP. And also in panel F, the ice water count is also like three times larger than the background state. Okay. And uh, you also notice in panel A that the reflectivity is all larger and is, we believe is purely meant by, by the higher concentration of ice. And, and, and why I'm saying that is if you look at panel D, the size of the uh, parameters are almost similar to the background state. But if you look at panel E, there's a jump of the number of concentrations here. And the thing why you don't see a continuously increase of concentration above, uh, you know, up to 10 kilometer and should be go even higher is because, you know, uh, S-band radar does have a limitation for seeing particles up to say 0.1 millimeter. And uh, we expect, you know, theoretically, it's more higher concentration, smaller particles above, but we don't see it in S-band. Um, and why there's no ZDR danger gross layer in panel B, uh, you know, we believe is mainly because of the uh, quasi-spherical ice uh, are falling from a lot of the mass such signatures. Um, and uh, next, please. And that comes to my conclusion is we are creating a climatology of different kinds of weather systems. And, and we believe that using such climatology is a great reference for modelers to do their model evaluation, validation. Can you replicate such uh, vertical profile time series? And uh, and we have separated the statistic 
of vertical profiles be between the high ice water content areas and the background state environment. Uh, so the marine tropical storms, marine MCS and hurricanes are usually characterized by smaller ice, but higher concentration compared with the uh, continental MCSs, but, but focused on the high ice water content areas, it is primarily due to a jump in the number of concentration rather than the uh, size uh, of, of the hydrometers from the back compared with the background state. And, and this points to why is that? Is that a homogeneous nucleation of uh, you know, excessive amounts of supercooled water uh, droplets or secondary ice production uh, possibly uh, make this happen? This is open question, or even what about ultrafine particles? Is it possible that plays a role in it? And so, and last but not least, uh, everyone, especially modelers, are very welcome to use this for validation. And we are looking for any collaborations in the future. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. First one who stuck to time. We have time a minute for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Um, oh, there's a question from Bender Rout. Why a higher ice water content has higher KDP? How does it relate to the shape of the ice particles? Some orientation is horizontal. Okay, so that's very good. So we're uh, we're looking at uh, mainly pristine ice. So we we have taken out you know the larger ice ice um, hydrometers like Hale or Grapple. Basically, uh, we only uh, like we only allow reflectivity over six kilometer for, to be less than thirty dBZ to to constrain that. And uh, we we have published uh, two papers, you know, using S band radar to see uh, there's a uh, if you want to look at quickly there's a linear relationship between KDP, which showing the concentration of the particles uh, about three point two. Um, if you multiply by this parameter, you can get a a relatively um, okay qualitative value uh, of ice water content in pristine ice uh, habits. Very cool. Thank you, Jaxi. No problem. Uh, next, we will have three short talks. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Chen Chen, and uh, the title is The Rose of Mineral Dust as uh, CCN Iron During the Evolution of a Hailstone. Thank you for the introduction. And thanks for all the co-authors from for the contributing to this work. So next slide, please. Uh, we use work model coupled with spectral beam microphysics and uh, we improved the ice nucleation processes. Particularly for the deposition and the condensation freezing, we use a parameterization from developed by our uh, group from Professor Inyan's group. And they, uh, this was based on measurement of uh, Tianshan Mountains in the northwest of China. So uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, here we show the simulated area which is located at the Xinjiang province in China. So uh, next. Uh, we did four simulations, including increased season of ion concentration separately or uh, simultaneously to test the relative contribution of season and ion. Uh, next, please. Uh, here we show the time evolution of number countries and the mixing ratio of different hydrometers in different simulations. So the increase in CCN resulting in large number of cloud droplets and the liquid water content. So for high season case, the concentration of hailstone increased between fifth and seventh hour of simulation due to the efficient production of hail by collisions between ice crystals and uh, liquid drops. So the, the melting of large number of hails resulted in more rain drops. Uh, well, in, in, the increase in iron number also does not affect warm processes, but uh, lead to large ice crystal number and enhanced bedroom processes. For high, high ice, a uh, high iron case, the large concentration of ice crystals lead to more snow particles and grapples, but reduce the concentration of uh, high stones at the screwing and the mature states. Uh, in high iron case, both the number and the mass concentration of high are smaller than that of the uh, case of control. Uh, next, please. Uh, here we show the vertical profiles of effective terminal velocity of hazmeters, which can um, indicate the size of hell. Uh, we found that high season lead to larger hells, while high iron lead to small hell uh, hailstones. So um, 
maybe I I I should I should stop here. Next is my summary. Thank you. Uh, this this two this these two slides just for backup. It's no need. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So the next speaker is uh, Xiao Fei Li, and the title is Notebook Contribution of Aerosols to the Pre uh, Predictability of the Hair Precipitation. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Xiao Fei Li from Northwest Uni uh, University, and uh, this work is co authored with Qin Hongzhang from Peking University, Ji Wen Fan from PNNL, and uh, Fu Qingzhang from Penn State. This study provides an assessment of the contribution of errors to uh, health predictability by varying both the CCNC and the in initial meteorological conditions. Next, please. Uh, the initial meteorological predictions here means uh, changes to the initial vertical profiles of the kinematic and the thermodynamic fields. We choose the same idealized case as we simulated for every ensemble group contain, uh, contains 50 members. Ensemble perturbations are from ECMWF ensemble, which is a kind of flow dependent perturbations. And all ensemble groups were performed by varying six CCNC. In total, 24 groups of ensembles consisting of 1,200 rounds were configured. Uh, next, please. The ratio of ensemble means over ensemble stress uh, defined as the signal to noise ratio is calculated. The values for hill pre uh, precipitation are a few times lower than those for the total precipitation. And we can find a non-monotonic uh, uh, response of hill precipitation to CCNC variation in the ensemble group R, uh, which shows an optimal CCNC at around the, uh, uh, 300. We also calculated the ratio of every ensemble spread of the control ensemble. The ratio range between the cleanest and the most polluted ensembles can be larger than the control ensemble, indicating that a larger uncertainty for CCNC than the meteorological perturbations. It also shows that reducing uncertainties in the initial meteorological conditions, especially reducing the thermodynamic perturbation, could lead to higher predictability in hail precipitation. In Good all minute. four meteorological settings, increasing CCNC leads to a non monotonic response, which suggests that wearing the initial meteorological conditions does not qualitatively change the aerosol effects on hill precipitation. The ensemble spreads can be reduced dramatically by constraining the initial meteorological perturbations. Uh, for more information and more details of this study, please refer to our latest published paper on GIL. That's all, thanks. Great, we have time for a question if there's any. There is none in the chat, so if you want to speak up or raise your hand, I'll keep an eye on the hands. And do we have more of the rapid talks, Phil, or are we done with the rapid talks? I think we have one more. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the next speaker is Sue Van Akiver, and uh, this should be a continuous talk uh, with the uh, mini park. Part two, the deep convective uh, mode. Yeah, thanks, Yui. And I think I've got, what, 20 minutes for this talk? Yeah, so <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so this, this talk is part two of the talk that many gave earlier today in which we've been investigating aerosol impacts on sea beach convection. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So as many described, we've been running large model ensembles representing the wide range of environmental conditions supportive of sea breeze convection. And many described the aerosol impacts on the overall sea breeze system. And now what I'm gonna look at is summarize the impacts of aerosols on that deep convective mode that you referred to. Next slide, please. So as many said, only 12 members of the 130 member clean ensemble produced 
deep convection. And so what we've shown here now are the average updraft velocities expressed as a percentage difference between the polluted and clean environments. And under this scenario, aerosol radiation interactions are turned on. And there are two points to note here. So only seven simulations in the polluted environment produce deep convection. This is actually due to aerosol direct effects on the, on the convective environment. And the second point to note is that both above and below the freezing level, which is shown here in blue, updraft velocities may either environment. So warm phase and cold phase updraft responses to aerosol loading are inconsistent and vary as a function of environment. Next slide, please. When you turn off aerosol radiation interactions, then all 12 polluted environments do indeed produce deep convection. However, the updraft response above the freezing level to polluted conditions once again varies as a function of environment. Next slide, please. However, below the freezing level, warm phase invigoration appears to be robust and independent of environment. Next slide, please. And when looking at precipitation, when aerosol radiation interactions are turned on, shown in the left, we see a consistent decrease in precipitation with increased aerosol loading. However, when aerosol radiation interactions are turned off, the precipitation response is environmentally modulated. Next slide, please. And so in summary then, uh, for the first point, for cold phase invigoration, we see an inconsistent response in updraft velocities to aerosol loading above the freezing level as a function of environment. For warm phase invigoration, we see that updrafts are consistently stronger across all environments when aerosol radiation interactions are turned off, but that they are environmentally modulated when aerosol radiation interactions are turned on. And then finally, we see that precipitation is suppressed in polluted conditions across all environments when aerosol radiation interactions are turned on, but the response is environmentally modulated when aerosol direct effects are excluded. And so with that, thank you. Uh, these 20 minutes flew by. We still have time for, for, for questions. I think Anne managed to fit 20 minutes worth of content into five. It's incredible. Um, so, Sue, quick question. With, with the aerosols, I mean, were these just, was, was the impact purely radiative? These, these were not hydroscopic aerosols. Was, was the effect uh, when you turned them on purely radiative? No, Scott, they were fully interactive microphysically and radiatively. So you've got direct and indirect okay. effect, fully interactive. Yeah. yeah. Any what other you, questions? What do you think the, I mean, do you have a feeling for what the partitioning of the effects were on your, your results? Yeah, that's, that's actually an interesting, it's an interesting question. And that's why we partitioned it out into aerosol on and off because we've been mm -hmm. trying to We've been trying to tease out the role of the indirect effects in this, mm -hmm. right? And so um, certainly we see different responses in terms of the robustness of cold phase and warm phase invigoration mm -hmm. when course. those aerosol radiation effects are turned on. So yeah. thank you very much. I think Danny, uh, Daniel has his hand up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, perhaps uh, could it be possible that the lower aerosol is still hi uh, too high uh, to produce a significant uh, invigoration effect? Yeah, Danny, that's a good question because the, the values here, you know, given how large the ensembles are, we had to pick two values. So you're right, the, the lower values may still be too high. And in the perfect world, I'd like to run another really large ensemble with even lower, uh, with even lower aerosol values. So your question is certainly a valid point, yeah. Jaiwen has her uh, hand up. Jaiwen, you want to go ahead? I see a mini. So yeah, actually, uh, I want to follow on the um, uh, Scott's question also um, about the question asked in the chat about uh, the um, single scatter, um, single scattery albedo, which is very important for how much aerosol direct effect will be. So we did a test uh, previously, you know, when we're assuming the, the 0 0.85, uh, which is pretty absorptive, then it's totally suppressed uh, aerosol indirect effect. 
it's just the error zone directly affect with the dominant because the error zone is too absorbing. So this the the, the relative importance between this uh, uh, direct and the indirect effect really depends on you know how much how how the error zone property absorbing properties was assumed. Yeah, your 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 point is also certainly a good point, and you know in the model the in terms of the way this is represented, the sulfates are both, they have absorbing and, and scattering properties. It varies as a function of relative humidity and so on um, because of the deliquescence. So you're right, there's certainly great sensitivity to that. In, in the way that our parameterization is structured, it is allowed to vary, but it is something that, you know, we have to, we have to bear in mind. You're correct. There's, you know, there's work to be done for sure in terms of assessing model sensitivities to such representations. I agree with that comment. Yuan uh, has his hand up. I apologize if I mispronounced yet your name. Oh, you pronounced perfectly. <laughs> yeah, a question for Su. Yeah, very nice uh, work. So yeah, uh, uh, I think it's more like a, a follow-on uh, question from Jiwen, like um, how to treat your uh, absorbing capability of aerosols. And also I believe the absorbing capability also depends on the vertical levels you put those aerosols. Uh, Another aspect um, I'm curious, like, um, uh, is your uh, in, in significance of the radiative effect uh, depend on like uh, the cloud fraction you have uh, during the system evolve? Because if you have a like a overlaying cloud layer on top of aerosol layer, the radiative effect may be diminished uh, to some extent, if I understand it. Yeah, your, your point is also good then in terms of taking into account um, aerosol radiation and cloud radiation, and it, and it takes into account both of those. So in terms of the parameterization, both, both, um, both interactions with aerosols and with the cloud layers are built into that radiative response. So yeah, but these are all important things and you both raise good points, right? So this is really where we need to evaluate our parameterizations and take them further. And I do want to point out that in these simulations, you know, we only, we have only included sulfates in terms of the, of the variation. Um, there's a lot of other things that we have a C the CSOF model on and things, but there's a lot of other things that should be investigated, particularly with reference to upcoming tracer, right? The tracer field campaign and the various aerosols involved in that. So um, I wish we could run thousands of, of yeah. these simulations if somebody's willing to give us even more computational capabilities because they're enormous and they take a long time. But um, you know, that's, those are, there's lots of things to explore. We, we, we've got to get some more DOE supercomputing time. Indeed. We've got uh, Jai Wen and then Zhang King after that. Jai Wen? Oh, okay, sorry. I think it's an accident, but I can still say something. I think this <laughs> session, <laughs> uh, yeah, this session, it's really uh, uh, very important uh, for, you know, for the discussion on the ensemble simulation. And, you know, we have a few uh, studies like from Xiao uh, Fei Li and uh, Mimi and Su and, you know, carry out this ensemble simulations. Also, Qin uh, Chen, those are the ensemble simulations. This kind of a, uh, a trend, and uh, it's very important. I'm glad to see um, lots of ensemble simulations carried on. And also those ensemble simulations indicate, still indicate aerosol effect with the varied you know, uh, the initial meteorological conditions. So there's still aerosol impact singular is seen. And we'll uh, pass on to Zhang King. Now, well, what time are we going to, by the way, Phil? I've got no idea. Ten more minutes, I think. Is oh, the great. Good, good, good. I so no so one's so. lost yet. Okay. I have a question for Sue and also Chen and Chen Chen. And Chen Chen. So for Sue, um, you know, really he fact um, is also determined by <clears throat> the cloud phase. If your simulation start with a clear sky, convection developed afterwards, then the the effect is much more important than if you start with uh, already a cloudy case, you know. So, so I want to clarify that. Um, for Chen Chen, my question is uh, your conclusion that uh, 
more C, more IN lead to smaller ice particles, and uh, but for more CCN lead to large ones. I think if this, if I could write, so I just want to have an explanation from you. Okay, so maybe Sue first. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, John King, it's a it's a, a clearly a good question. We start out um, with with clear sky. These are idealized scenarios, and we let the simulation spin up. So we allow the whole sea breeze circulation to develop. So you're correct that it starts out completely clear. We allow the thermal circulation to to get going, the clouds to develop, and we we analyze from there. So your point, yeah, I hope yeah, I hope that answers what you were asking. Thank you. Do we have, uh, oh, sorry, I see, yeah. sorry. So I will answer my question. Uh, so I found that high season lead to large hailstones, but the high iron lead to smaller ones, because in the high season case, it leads to large super cold liquid water content, which will be contributed to the enhanced hail growth by more efficient drop ice collisions and lead to large size of high hailstones. But for the large iron number uh, case, uh, it will reduce the size of gravel and surprise the growth of hailstones. Did I answer your question? Yeah, we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And while we get some more questions, I do want to put an advertisement out for tomorrow where we're really going to be talking a lot more about Tracer and the ACPC roadmap. I want folks especially to look at the modeling studies done today and the observational studies by folks like Jaxi and think about, you know, Jaxi threw this, this line out and said, you all want to use my data to uh, uh, compare the models. And that's kind of where we want the roadmap to go is to really map that space between them. And uh, Andy, I see you've got your hand up there. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask, so uh, how dependent are your simulations of the large scale environment? Uh, I mean, wouldn't this be very diff different, uh, say, in a tropical versus a subtropical versus a, a temperate coast? I mean, in the Amazon, it's very frequently observed that uh, the sea breeze front actually detaches and then goes inland and becomes uh, something like an MCC, actually. Yeah, Andy, your question is a good one. And we've done quite a lot of work in tropical, primarily in tropical environments. I suspect that as you move into mid-latitude scenarios, you will find different responses by virtue of, well, for the vegetation for a start, um, as well as, you know, the interaction. Many talk to um, the interactions and the importance of, for example, the surface fluxes, the latent and sensible heat fluxes, so all of that's all of that's going to change in that environment um, as well. And in fact, in these simulations now, uh, Minnie's actually now, um, before she defended her PhD, ran another suite of these large ensembles in which we, vary, we varied the vegetation scenarios to represent different environments in that regard. And we're busy um, um, within our group, we're now busy analyzing those um, experiments with different vegetation responses and to see, you know, to see, to get to those questions that you're asking. So, yeah, yeah well, uh, they will you're right, and they will be sensitive to, sensitively to it. Um, so that's what we're trying to assess. So, so your simulation was for a, a tropical system, a tropical environment? Yeah, that's correct, Andy. Yeah. Yep. I mean, yep. It would yeah. seem then that actually your, your CCN concentration is probably too high. I would think that, like, if I'm thinking of the Brazilian coast, for instance, um, I would expect uh, much lower concentrations of CCN, which your, your sulfate basically uh, represents uh, to come in from the Atlantic. Yeah, Andy, we took, it's actually um, representative of regions over the Congo. And yeah. we took numbers from there, actually observed numbers from there, but you know, with the high biomass burning scenarios on the go That's there true. and all the various aerosol counts on there, I'm, you know, I'm preaching to the converted here. You well know, know all of these things, but those numbers can be quite variable. So we took from, um, they were based in observations, but it's come back to Danny's point too, that it would be nice to test a low end um, of that, a lower end of that spectrum. So yeah, okay. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you really much. Great conversation. Jaxi. Yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> Since I see a lot of modelers in this room, I just want to quickly make like a survey question, <laughs> you know, like how many of you have tried the forward operator to compare with your result with the 
you know, radar observation, especially polarization, dual polarization radar result. Like, can, can you represent a reasonable melting layer? Can you simulate a ZDR column before the huge uh, main precipitation shaft starts? You know, all those, um, you know, phenomena we see a lot every day in the radar. Is that possible in the modeling community? You know, something like that. <laughs> Just want to get a sense of it. Jackson, are you asking more generally? I mean, I can answer more generally. Yeah, go ahead, sure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, we can do that. And we've been working a lot with Mariko, actually, on mm -hmm. using her CR sim and producing, you know, um, in essence, you know, these forward simulators to do the very thing you're suggesting. And we'd certainly like to talk with you a whole lot more on that as well. That would be awesome. Really, it would be great. Sure. So I think it's really critical to do these things. But the short answer is yes, we can pick up uh, um, in the models, we can pick up a, a lot of those basic features that, that you're asking about. But I would like to talk with you more. So. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I want to kind of add to Jaxi's question, specifically ask a question to Jaiwen on her presentation, where you showed the hail uh, from the, I believe mean, that was Wharf Chem that was being produced. So, because a lot of what Jaxi's talking about depends on the definition of the hydrometeor in the model and what it means. Um, so, Jaiwen, you know, when you look at something like Wharf Chem, how realistic is the hail physics in there? And what is the hail physics actually tied to? I mean, what do you vary in Wolf Cam to get hail? Does it even care about the air? What, what is it responding to in the aerosol content to give you the hail? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's, uh, yes, uh, it, that, was, that is a very good question. By the way, we have not looked at uh, those details yet. Uh, mm -hmm. Generally, we do evaluate the hail uh, with uh, the hail um, size and, and you know, occurrences from the SPC mm -hmm. um, data and also from the mesh data, you know, rather red, red retrieve the hail. So we do think uh, the model give a reasonable simulation, but uh, we didn't that, uh, Get into the details in value to hail macrophysics, like uh, like what Jiaxin said, how it look like at this uh, um, below the melty level, or how the KDP look like, and mm. those are, are yeah indeed uh, requires a forward simulator, and in in the wolf um, in wolf spectrum being um, we have this uh, forward simulator. Uh, which Alex had uh, and uh, Alex uh, Richkov, you know that, Jiaxin knows that. <laughs> you know, they worked together and developed this uh, forward simulator. So it's mm -hmm. there, um, but usually because it's too expensive and wow. generally we, we don't turn on. <laughs> but <laughs> we, in some, I think in previous uh, cases in the, in the Houston, we did a turn on, look at the KDP and it was uh, actually um, much better when we look at mm. uh, in, in the uh, polluted case compared to the clean case. Uh, the polluted case in the Houston actually agree with the, the observed KDP of vertical involution better. Uh, with, that's um, what we saw before, yeah. Your, your point on computational expense is really interesting. And I think it would be good for this group to get together and document some of these butt falls. Um, what are the things that are really holding back some of these capabilities? Because there might be solutions out there with people with the correct resources able to uh, throw at this. So that's really, really interesting. And I can, I can say one thing is that the, uh, mesh is really needs a lot of improvements, and we are actually working on another version for hail um, detection and the size. So um, hopefully later yeah. we can show that as well. I mean, yeah. I'll advertise, Jaxi, some of the work from Joshua Soddenholm from Australia. He's, they've done some really cool work where they've actually used retrieve winds to kind of look at the offset of the mesh to look at hail production. There's some stunning stuff. Actually, it's, it's so funny as we kind of try and use more products and more modeling, how the modeling exposes the, the shortcomings of the retrievals, and then the retrievals ask for more from the models and we kind of have this, this continual improvement circle. So 
Very cool. I think we've got, um, am I reading this right? We've got about a minute left. Is that right, Philip? I don't know the end time of the program, but assuming it's a full hour, yes. it's a minute till the full yep. hour. Oh, I see Stephen's got his hand up there. Sorry, Stephen. A quick follow-up question about the, the hail for um, g -Win. Um, In looking at how the um, aerosol affects the hail, you saw that it affects less so on the, the embryo formation, but more on the hail growth. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just kind of wondering if, you know, if our models handle the hail formation differently, you know, that could handle the aerosol effects differently. So I'm just wondering if you're, you know, how the wharf chem handles the initial hail formation. So the normal thing if you change the aerosols, you change the cloud droplet number, you change the formation of uh, the number of raindrops, which can freeze or not freeze. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about how the change in the raindrop distribution might change the initial hail embryo formation. Yes, uh, that's a good point. Uh, actually, hair formation is uh, act has a large uncertainty, particularly in the border um, parameterization. So it really depends. I think that conclusion is uh, will need further study to see if it's robust or not. But uh, but the hair growth indeed it's uh, it's robust. I think uh, the hair uh, the large hair growth through ramming you know for each uh, embryo you know it went through more growth because the supercooled droplet size decreased and then it can be after recycled it can be picked up again into the updraft so have another round of growth. That's why you know that is more robust. Um, uh, yes, so I think we really need to, uh, in the model, you know, uh, raindrop frizzy can form a hair and mm -hmm. then uh, rhyming and can form hair and other, maybe other processes. So those processes indeed is copied there in the model, but also, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Yeah. It is, yeah. We, I ask because we see some very similar responses in the RAMS model. So we're going to I'll highlight a little bit of that to, in the talk tomorrow as well. So thank oh, you. Great. Yeah. There's a, thermo, there's a thermodynamic, thermodynamic effect as well. There's a there's a you know uh, a direct effect. Mm. Uh, cool. Um, you want to close us out, uh, Philip? It wasn't part of my job description, but I'm happy happy to. <laughs> Hey, I can do it as well, but uh, or we could do it together. So, all right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. This has been a really, really good conversation. I have found this very, very interesting.